The public can attend tonight's meeting in person at the George DeZero City and County Buildings Council Chamber, located at London Home Drive, or watch live on Channel 8 through live streaming on Broomfield's website. The public may also participate in public comment either in person or by calling 855-695-3744 and pressing star 3 to be placed in the queue for comment. Please note that if you're calling in for public comment, I would like to speak on more than one item on tonight's agenda. You'll need to press star three each time to be placed in the queue for comment. Public comment will be limited to 90 minutes total per item. The first one through 15 participants in the queue have three minutes to speak. The next 16 through 25 in the queue have two minutes. And if time remains, the next 26 plus participants in the queue have one and a half minutes to speak. Again, if joining virtually for public comment, the number is 855-695-3744 and press star 3 to be placed in the queue. Screeners will ask callers for their first and last name, neighborhood, and the agenda item the caller would like to comment on. Please call several minutes before the agenda item and press star 3 to ensure you're in the queue for comment. If joining in person, we'll ask that you come to the podium, state your name and neighborhood for the record. The City Council meeting is called to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Anderson? Here. Cohen? Here. Groom? Here. Pinkle? Here. Jazerski? Here. Ma Evans? She, she is supposed to be here. Councilman Ma Evans, are you there? Or is it not yet? I think not yet. She'll be later. Okay, fine. Lim, here. Lindstedt? Here. Shaft? Here. Tessier? Here. A quorum is present. Can everyone please rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. To keep order for tonight's meeting, I ask council members to limit their comments to five minutes. Abby will be assisting with the timekeeping. Additionally, please remember council's rules of procedure regarding conduct. When possible, council member comments and communication should be limited to five minutes per individual per item. If council members are given an opportunity to speak for a second time on an item, they should limit their comments and communications to two minutes. We'll plan on a 10 minute break at approximately 8 p.m. We will begin with council's review and approval of this evening's agenda. Council may add or remove items from the consent agenda, or council may revise the order of business for the meeting. Does any member of the council have any comments or questions regarding this evening's agenda? Seeing none, are there any objections to this agenda being approved? Seeing none, the agenda is approved. There are no petitions or communications this evening. We'll move into general public comment next. This is an opportunity for the public to comment on matters other than the items already listed on this evening's agenda. As mentioned earlier, the public may comment both in person or via phone. If you're joining via phone and want to be placed in the queue for comment, the number to call is 855-695-3744 and press star three. If you're joining in person, please line up behind the podium. Public comments will be limited to the time limits outlined earlier. We'll start with in-person public comment. Is there anyone who would like to be heard, please come to the podium, state your name and neighborhood for the record, and limit your comments to three minutes. Good evening, Mayor, Council. Nick Cleveland, I live in the Broadlands. I'm here this evening to speak about something that has been brought to the entire community's attention, and I don't think it's gotten the proper attention from this council. On June 29th, this council gave clear direction to staff, which happens to be the last time this council actually had anything to do with the policy making around the homelessness issue. Gave clear direction to staff to look into potential homelessness encampment sites. That policy decision turned out to be wildly unpopular among the community. And they let staff know, and they let you know about this policy. 
to which staff switched gears without an, an, an additional meeting and allowed this council to take a new direction uh, at the recommendation of staff. We never got to hear what you as our elected officials had to say about the policy that you had directed staff just a month earlier on. What's more, in September, you held a town hall meeting. That was wildly unfulfilling. Uh, this was more of a lecture series for folks who were in the homelessness industry. And they were telling us what this council was preparing to do to our community rather than getting input from the citizens, which is the purpose of a town hall. I'm gonna speak for a number of folks that I spoke with that night who were offended that they were called classists and perhaps even white supremacists because they offered concern in July about possible homelessness encampments in the city and county of Broomfield. Quite frankly, it's offensive. I actually shared some email exchanges with some folks involved with those organizations who actually agreed with me. I think this council and staff owes the community an apology for those statements. I know a lot of the people who were in the audience in July, not one of them was concerned about people who were down on their luck that had been recently experienced a job loss or just down and out. They were concerned about what they see every single day in downtown Denver, the hypodermic needles, the human feces, people passed out on the 16th Street Mall. I walk by some every single day I go to my office downtown. That's what they were concerned with. It's belittling to tell the community who came here in good faith to express their concerns that they were experiencing classism and perhaps even white supremacists because they were concerned about that. I think this body owes the community an apology and this council owes the public a firm statement on which direction this council wants to go with the homelessness issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else? I don't see anyone else in the chambers and there's no one online. Council's community and event updates are next. Does any member of council have an update this evening? Well, I do. I would like to invite everyone to the 16th annual Friend Rocks fundraiser this Sunday, October 17th at 4.30 p.m at the Alamo Draft House in Westminster. The theme for this year's variety show is Rock on the Big Screen, and tickets can be purchased in advance at friendsofbrinkfield.org. Council's consideration of the consent agenda is next. We will review this evening's consent agenda in three parts, as item 7D and 15A is an item for the Broomfield Urban Renewal Authority, and item 7E is a request for an executive session and requires an individual motion. Following the clerk's reading of consent agenda item 7A through 7C, we will ask for public comments. Will the clerk please read agenda item 7A through 7C by title? 7A, <clears throat> approval of minutes from regular meeting of September 28, 2021, and special meeting of September 30, 2021. 7B is resolution number 2021-163, authorizing and approving the guaranteed maximum price amendment to the construction manager slash general contractor agreement by and between the city and county of Broomfield and Moltz Construction Inc. for the interlocking lift station rehabilitation project. 7C is ordinance number 2166, amending chapter 2-52, of the Broomfield Municipal Code relating to library fines and penalties. Thank you. We'll now proceed with public comments. We'll start with in-person public comment. If there's anyone who would like to be heard, please come to the podium. Someone being screened online, but it doesn't say what they're for. So um, we'll get back to that. Does any member of council have comments on these three agenda items? Councilmember Lynn. I just had a question about 7C. Um, the uh, motivation for that ordinance was that um, it would be 
beneficial for um, children um, not to have um, late library fines because otherwise um, parents might be hesitant to allow children to take out the materials if they were to incur the fines. So I, that's a great idea. I'm just wondering, are we gonna do some follow-up with messaging, getting the word out on that, I guess? Because if parents are of the mindset already that I don't wanna bring my children to the library because we're gonna have to pay the fines, then we need to tell them, yeah, you know, we need to get the message out that we, we don't have that anymore. It's not a deterrence. You're invited to come. Welcome. So that was my question is how will that message be spread after we pass this? Dalton, should this line up or uh, we have somebody from our thank you. Yeah, I'm Sarah Johnson. I'm a children's library supervisor. And so yeah, we would be very excited to tell the public that we are removing the loss and damage fees for children's materials at the library. Um, we actually don't have late fees anymore at the library. That was passed a couple years ago. Um, so that's already in effect. And so we do um, have, have um, plans to include this messaging in our increased outreach to the community. Um, and we've already been establishing those networks in the elementary schools and in the community. Um, did you have any specific questions? No, that's wonderful. That's okay. That addresses my question. Thanks. Thank you. Any other council member questions? All right. Is there a motion that the recommendations contained in the staff reports for agenda item 7A through 7C be approved? Council member Shah? So moved. Can I have a second? Council member Petier? Second. Thank you. Will the clerk please call the roll? Anderson? Yes. Cohen? Yes. Grimm? Yes. Hinkle? Yes. Jazerski? Yes. Law Evans? Sorry. Lim? Yes. Lindstedt? Yes. Schaff? Yes. Tessier? Yep. Thank you. That passes unanimously. Next is the Broomfield Urban Renewal Authority's consideration of item 7D slash 15A. The meeting of the Broomfield Urban Renewal Authority is called to order. I'll ask the clerk to call the roll to the Broomfield Urban Renewal Authority. Anderson? Here. Cohen? Here. Grimm? Here. Finkel? Here. Jazerski? Here. Law Evans? Lim? Here. Lindstedt? Here. Mitchell Nelson. All right, thank you. Corn has a chap. Thank you. The quorum is still present. Will the clerk please read agenda item 70 slash 15A by title? Approval of the Broomfield Urban Renewal Authority minutes of August 10, 2021. We will now proceed with public comments. We'll start with in person. Are there any public comments on this agenda item? Seeing none, does any member of the borough have any comments on this agenda item? All right, is there a motion that the recommendations contained in the staff report for agenda item 70 slash 15A be approved? Council Member Shaw. So moved. May I have a second? Council Member Tessier. Is there any discussion? Will the clerk please call the roll? Cohen? Yes. Broom? Yes. Finkel? Yes. Jusowski? Yes. Law F. Lim? Yes. Lindstrom? Yes. Shaft? Yes. Tessier? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Thank you. That passes unanimously. The final item under consent agenda for council's consideration is a request for an executive session relating to personnel matters. Following the clerk's reading of consent agenda item 70, we will ask for public comment. Will the clerk please read agenda item 70 by title? Request for executive session regarding discussion of personnel matters relating to the city and county manager and city and county attorney. Thank you. We'll now proceed with public comments. 
starting with in person, please step up to the podium if you would like to make comment. Seeing none online, next, does any member of council have any comment on this item? Will the city and county attorney please read the motion? That an executive session regarding personnel matters be held on October 26, 2021 at 5 15 p.m. prior to council's regular meeting as permitted by CRS section 24 6 402 subsection 4F1. Thank you. Is there a motion? Council Member Shaw? So moved. Is there a second? Council Member Tessier? Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Will the clerk please call the roll? Broom. Yes. Hinkle. Yes. Jazerski. Yes. Law Evans. Lim. Yes. <laughs> Lindstedt. Yes. Schaff. Yes. Tessier. Yeah. Anderson. Yes. Cohen. Yes. Thank you. That passes unanimously. There is no business before the Board of Social Services this evening. This evening, we do have a COVID-19 update for the Board of Health's review. The meeting of the Board of Health is called to order. I ask the clerk to call the roll for the Board of Health. Anderson? Here. Cohen? Here. Groom? Here. Kinkle? Here. Jazerski? Here. Law Evans? Lynn? Here. Lindstedt? Here. Schaff? Here. Tessier? Here. Here. Thank you. Quorum is present. Board members have a copy of the agenda memorandum, which I'll ask our staff to summarize. Thank you, Mary, and good evening, Council and Community. Jason Bowling, Director of Public Health, will um, do a, a high-level overview from the meeting that we had um, every other Monday on public health. Mr. Bowling. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hoffman, and good evening, uh, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and Council members. It's a pleasure to be in front of you again tonight to give the latest update on where we're at the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, some of the key highlights is our hospital system is still stressed right now. Um, we're seeing that as far as the number of individuals that are being admitted to the hospital with COVID, uh, you compound that with the normal hospital procedures that we need to continually have, especially when you consider ICU beds, and then lastly, the staffing uh, availability to be able to manage those beds. It's pretty clear that what's driving up the hospitalizations are among the unvaccinated uh, population. 78% um, of those currently in the hospital are unvaccinated. Um, and I'd like to look closely at our Broomfield numbers. Broomfield is not a major contributor to hospitalizations. And as we've talked about, Throughout this pandemic, we're looking primarily at severity and severity metrics. Um, and my belief is we see a lot of the other surrounding counties that are contributing highly to where we're at as far as statewide hospitalizations. A couple other things I wanted to highlight is that case rates are de uh, decreasing nationally. We saw the huge spike in the um, southeast, uh, and we're starting to see spikes in the, in the mountain region. What we're seeing is that, that those cases, we're not seeing cases decrease in Colorado. We're in this place of an unstable place with cases. We're not sure if the trend is going to start moving back up or if we'll see the cases move down. And we all know that cases are a leading indicator of uh, hospitalization. As far as statewide, uh, we continue to see that youth ages 6 to 11 and 12 to 17 have the highest rates. Thankfully, in Broomfield, our um, rates among 12 to 17 year olds are not trending the same way. I truly believe that's due to our high vaccination rates in those age groups, uh, hence why our public health order goes from ages uh, 2 to 11 years versus all the way up to ages uh, 18. A uh, couple other key highlights. Um, the FDA is convening this week to review booster shots from Moderna and J&J. &J. Uh, we'll wait to see what the outcomes of those meetings are. And then the advisory committee on immunization practice meets shortly after that. Additionally, FDA will review the 
Pfizer submission for uh, the vaccine for five to eleven year olds, and that's going to take place on October twenty sixth. I heard the, the advisory committee on immunization practice a scheduled meeting on November second, but hopefully we'll get some recommendations at that point of approval by the CDC and finally start being able to move with this population group. And then lastly, as far as where we're at our focus for the remainder of the calendar year, is we're going to continue to mitigate transmission in high-risk settings. We're seeing our mitigation efforts are working, specifically in those areas where we have unvaccinated populations and congregate areas. Uh, so we do have more outbreaks in schools. Um, what we're finding is even in those outbreaks, they're primarily in ages 11 and under, they're not in the ages 12 plus. So the mitigation of masks plus vaccines are working very well. And our outbreaks are much lower than the rest of the surrounding counties when it comes to school outbreaks. Uh, we're also going to focus on making sure our currently vaccinated population receives their booster shots uh, to keep that high level of protection against both transmission, so that we know there's waning immunity with the vaccine, but also to prevent severe uh, disease, hospitalizations, and deaths. And then lastly, a major push for us to reach out to parents and uh, work with our providers to get the 5 to 11 year olds vaccinated. So with that, that concludes my high level presentation. I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Bali. Next, we'll go to public comments. If there are any public comments on this agenda item, please come up to the podium. I'm not seeing any online either. Are there any council member comments? Council member Cohen? Thank you. I just had a real quick question. I wanted to follow up on testing. One thing that we're pushing really hard at my university is to remind people that you can have COVID and flu. You can have COVID, I believe, and a cold. You can have COVID and allergies. And to not delay getting a COVID test if you feel some sort of symptoms, because that could either extend your quarantine, you might eventually have to test. And I've also heard people who are trying to get free test kits from the state that it sometimes takes 10 days and on request. So what are the options for room for residents to get a quick test and is there a cost? Again, we have our uh, community-based uh, testing uh, sites that are available through like pharmacies and uh, state run programs. Uh, there's a listing on our website of where all the sites are. Uh, secondly, we are working closely with the state to order those at-home test kits uh, to have them available to residents, especially those residents that we believe are in high-risk settings that we need to use them more often. Our two schools have enrolled in the testing programs, so they are using uh, testing. Um, and lastly, uh, we hope to see uh, Councilmember Cohen a greater rollout of those home-based testing as a screening methodology uh, for people. Um, I think you're exactly right. Uh, two things is this flu season could be potentially worse than our past flu season, which makes perfect sense. We were all um, in isolation. You know, we, we had capacity restrictions, all of that last year. Now we're intermingling before. So that'll lead to potentially more flu spread. So we're encouraging everybody to get your flu vaccine and you can get it at the same time that you're doing your COVID vaccine. And then secondly, again, if you've been exposed to or have symptoms, seek out testing immediately. Thank you very much. Thank you. Board Member Green. Yes, thank you. Um, a few questions. What percent vaccinated are we now? Uh, so we're up to, uh, let me get the exact number, 82% of our eligible population is fully vaccinated. Nice. Right. Yeah. We have to be leading the state. Are we we're number close? five. Oh, but okay. three of the counties are like tiny, tiny counties that <laughs> can go around and vaccinate every single member. <laughs> Not that it's a conversation, but <laughs> <laughs> um, 
And then um, are we going to track the boosters or is that something that people are, are doing on their own as it becomes available? Yeah, so we're working with the state <laughs> health department on the methodology for tracking, tracking the boosters. Um, we can't break down if there are additional doses for the immunocompromised or truly the boosters. That's one thing we're working through. But we do know at this point, uh, let me pull up the specific numbers. That's 7.3% uh, of all fully vaccinated group residents have received an additional dose. And it's good to see that that's happening in our vulnerable population, that you would see more vaccine breakthroughs. 21% uh, of those are in the 70 plus age group, and 14.3 are in the 60 to 69 age group. And then I've noticed you guys have been really active with the mobile bus and getting out and about. And I know we're not getting the hundreds of thousands we used to get, but the 50, 60, 100 at a time. Um, How is that working out? And what kind of more support is needed to reach those vulnerable populations or the um, talkative populations that you mentioned earlier? Yeah, um, actually, we looked at our census tracts and we were able to see from June to now, we've made great strides in getting our entire county and census tracts uh, vaccinated. We still have some populations out there. The mobile clinics have, or mobile bus has been wonderful because we can show up to community events. There's uh, fish, for example, and convenient, easy. And we also understand that they will be providing it for the five to 11 year olds as well. And so we're already into discussions with partners who serve that population, the most obvious one is schools to see what ways can we come up with a vaccine bus in the setting. All right, then um, I do need to ask about the two to so five year olds. Yeah. What, um, can you talk about um, the numbers that we need to reach in order for them to not have to wear masks? Yeah. In the it's a great question, Council Member Groom. I know that's a question that comes up the most yeah. often is what's the offering? For these orders. Um, and the way I've been looking at it is again, we're in a different spot than our surrounding counties who have mass orders uh, from two to age of 18. We're already at two to 11. Looking at those younger populations now that they're eligible, uh, we want to be able to see vaccine uptake in that group. So what we're talking about is at a region is if you have 70% vaccination as a community within the five to 18 year full of age group is one key measure. Uh, second key measure is looking at community case rates. Um, the CDC obviously defines uh, less than 50 uh, per 100,000 community case rates as uh, being a moderate transmission and no longer su substantial. And I think in Broomfield, when we start to get our five to 11 year old group vaccinated because we're talking about roughly 5,000 people out of our 20,000 that are not vaccinated. That'll so make a huge dent in that community transmission. Perfect, thank you very much. You're welcome. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mary. All right, board member Shannon. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so, Mr. Ballard, thank you for the presentation. I'm curious, uh, with the five to 11 year olds uh, for that vaccine, uh, what is the state uh, looking for uh, to do to kind of roll out that vaccine? Uh, what kind of system will it take? Uh, are they looking at how the, the timeline for those plans to be able to roll out the vaccine to that age group? Yeah, um, they've already started that planning and a, and a major focus is to increase the number of enrolled providers, specifically uh, pediatric providers. And we've been working closely with our pediatricians here in Brookfield about um, their ability to uh, offer the vaccine. Second thing is obviously our existing infrastructure of pharmacies, um, our uh, healthcare partners and systems will be, will be offering the vaccine as well. So we know there will be adequate uh, availability to get the vaccine and access. Again, I think where we want to focus is my assumption is Brentville will have a high interest in vaccine uptake with our parents, but how do we target those 
populations and they have some backing hesitancy and that's why we're discussing the mobile bus and other avenues to make sure we get it up to the Paco to 11 year old. So we won't uh, expect to see kind of a first bank center vaccination site or you know anything you know like a major vaccination site like that. Yeah, I think with this population, it's a little bit more challenging just because uh, the the dose that you're giving is different. And then secondly, you want to have parents there obviously to have the parent involvement in getting the vaccine, and so. We prefer to do it where the, the five to 11 year old, but our dear at four to again, there's going to be plenty of provider opportunities for them to learn where to go to that thing. And the one thing I'll also mention is we have our traditional immunization clinic at Brentville Public Health, and we offer the flu vaccine. As people are coming in for vaccines, we're also going to be offering COVID vaccines, and we have a referral mechanism between our women in and children's program and also our women effective health and family planning program to make sure that we get some of our more uh, vulnerable populations access to the vaccine. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Any other board member questions? Seeing none, the Board of Health meeting is adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Bolling. This evening, we have two items before the Brookfield Housing Authority. The meeting of the Broomfield Housing Authority is called to order. I'll ask the clerk to call the roll of the Broomfield Housing Authority. Anderson? Here. Cohen? Here. Broom? Here. Engle? Here. Kuzerski? Here. Law Evans? Lim? Here. Lindstedt? Here. Shaft? Here. Tessier? Here. The quorum is present. The first item for the Housing Authority's consideration this evening is the public hearing of a resolution to approve an intergovernmental agreement with the City and County of Broomfield and the Broomfield Housing Authority. Item 11A is a resolution for Council's consideration related to the same topic. We will, we will review these items concurrently this evening. I'll declare the public hearing open. We will follow the City's standard public hearing procedure. First, staff will present a summary of the proposal. Next, we'll have the applicant's presentation if applicable. Then we'll ask for public comments and final comments from the applicant. <laughs> final questions from the city council, the city council members, or the housing authority. Board members have a copy of the agenda memorandum, which I'll ask our staff to summarize. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Mr. Romine. I'm going to let him uh, dictate what name he wants to go by tonight. <laughs> this much awaited uh, evening where we are finally beginning to uh, see the end of the road um, in handing the independent housing authority to um, rather than from an advisory committee to an actually functioning housing authority body. We're very excited about it. The housing authority, um, the current housing uh, committee is here. And Jeff's going to walk us through this presentation that will help all of us understand what the weeds look like with regards to the IGA. We always know that the devil is in the details. Mr. Romine. Thank you, uh, City and County Manager Hoffman and Acting Executive Director of the Brookfield Housing Authority Hoffman, <laughs> Mayor, Board Chair. Members of City Council and uh, Commissioners of the Brookfield Housing Authority, since you are all, all of that. Um, I'm going to be speaking on behalf of both the city and then the applicant. Bob Monroe is here as the Vice Chair of the Brookfield um, Housing Advisory Committee also, as well as uh, Lee uh, Applegate is, I believe, on the phone. Um, in case we have questions, she has been acting as the attorney during this process for the applicant, if you will. And then also Cheryl Sinclair is here, um, who is a housing consultant to the city. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the, the true, last time I used a reference about my particular role, but the true parents, the true people that have brought this together, and brought this proposal forward, and ultimately the idea that, that you're considering tonight, are these members of the advisory committee, as well as some other folks who have obviously worked on this, in various roles, and of course, the entire city council uh, has played a significant role as we've been going through this process. And so, I just wanted to 
to call out these individuals and make sure that they were noted for the hard work they've been doing for the last, um, it seems like a lifetime for many of them, I'm sure. Um, and we are hopeful that some of them will continue in some of the service to the city and county of winter going forward. Next slide, please. Just as a reminder, there have been significant accomplishments while we've been doing this process and this kind of organizational work. There's been significant progress made within the community around bringing additional housing units forward uh, for uh, those who need housing or those both uh, in need, as well as some of our programs that are supporting individuals as they seek to overcome housing insecurity at this point. Um, so these are the items that we just wanted to call out briefly to you and, and note them again. As you can see in 2021, thus far, we have 1,259 commitments for additional four rent or four cell units within the community going forward. Those will be coming online in the future uh, years, but nevertheless, uh, some of them are already in place. In addition, we believe that we will have roughly 50, 50 I'm sorry, $5.7 million in cash and loop payments coming to the city in the near future. Um, and so that's a, there's a lot of accomplishments that have been occurring here, and we don't want to undermine or, or, or minimize those accomplishments when we're talking about what we're doing next. And so as members of the Burnfield Housing Authority, which you all are, you should feel very proud of these accomplishments and the work that's been done on your behalf by the Burnfield Housing Advisory Committee. Um, in addition, I would just point out that there has been two housing studies that have been completed. Uh, over the last several years. One was an update to the existing housing study, which still indicates that we have a gap of roughly 1,400 units of, of needed housing for those who are housing insecure in one form or another. That is the work that we're really talking about going forward. So when we really focus back, it is not so much about the independence of a board, it is really about how to accentuate and get that work done to really serve all of our residents, but specifically those in need. Um, and so, uh, next slide, please. These are the four items I'm going to cover briefly tonight in the presentation, and you will notice within the IGA, as City County Manager Hoffman pointed out, the devil is in the details of any agreement. Obviously, I, I will tell you at one point, I, and this is absolutely true, I was on the phone, we were talking to four different attorneys all at the same time about this in a matter of less than a half hour. And so I want to thank uh, the city and county attorney uh, for her work, because she personally helped on this, uh, as well as two of her staff uh, attorneys. And then also Nikki, uh, our HR director, got directly involved in some of the questions that we're facing. So trying to understand and figure out how to do this right has been a high priority since we last came before you. So again, we're going to look through these four items. Next slide, please. Should be noted that there is a mission that we're talking about. Now, the Bloomfield Housing Authority may adjust this mission once they formally meet as an independent board coming forward in 2022. But nevertheless, these have been the core values that have been talked about by the committee um, and they're expressed within the work that they've been doing. Next slide, please. So, one of the things that, that the council talked about, it, and as members you all asked about, was what specifically will they be doing? They have been incorporated within the IGA. You can see these items, they're literally taken from the IGA. In order to identify what, what the Broomfield Housing Authority will be doing going forward, and again, these are things that we've been doing um, through our combined efforts of the city and the housing authority over the last several years. But nevertheless, these are the key responsibilities. And I would just point out several of them to you. Um, I'm not going to read them all. Um, I know um, it's a lot of uh, words up here, but they will be, they will advise and support um, our nonprofit and private organizations to develop and bring forward additional housing projects within our community. That is core to their, their effort. The second thing I would point out is, is that their goal is to be innovative. And so we use the example of the ADUs, but that's just one example. That is not the only thing. And obviously, we, can, we need to do more work around the ADUs and, and the implementation of that idea. But there are many other things that we can be bringing forward. And so bringing this focus, both of the housing authority, specifically through uh, an independent board, a focus board is really maybe a better way to phrase that, um, and then continue that work. In addition, and I would throw, I would throw these other two things out there. One is, is it allows them to be the owner and the limited partner, the liability issue that we've talked about. And the Bloomfield Housing Authority will have direct liability because they'll be a partner in it. 
in many of these projects as they move forward. And then finally, and this is probably the thing that we have, we talked a little bit about probably to emphasize, but it was brought up yesterday in our housing advisory committee um, very clearly. And that is, is oftentimes there's federal or state funds or quite frankly, private foundation funds that may be available to this type of an organization that we may not be able to reach out to you as a city and county of Bloomfield. And so creating that, we increase the possibility of growing the pot of money and growing the work that's being done, whether it be creating and buying, um, we're not creating land, but buying land, dedicating that land and, and utilizing that, whether it be through a sale or holding it and, and through a lease agreement. So those are the types of things that we're really talking about. Those four items really stand out as key functions of what this group is going to do. And it's not that we haven't been doing them, and, and you as the housing authority haven't been doing them, but it allows it to be even more so, put a little bit more time, a little bit more muscle into that place. Next slide, please. So one of the key things is obviously, first thing in most people's mind is, is what are we paying? Um, and it, within the agreement, as, as we noted in our um, uh, preliminary work that we did, we are intending to provide $3 million from the city and county Broomfield to the Broomfield Housing, Housing Authority to, as an initial grant. The intent is for that to last roughly three years. It may last a little bit less, depending on how many projects they do um, and what those costs are. But that's the goal, is to provide them adequate funding to get started and something that they know they have in their checkbook. Um, and this will result in at least 100 affordable dwelling units being created or obligated um, at, at 30 to 60% EMI. Obviously, we want to emphasize moving toward the 30% uh, where the greatest need is, but we recognize that is the range of how the work is done. Um, and these will be beyond the work and beyond the projects that we've already committed to or to we're in the midst of uh, committing to. You will note that we'll be bringing a project to city council for action in November. Those units will not count, and that money is coming from the city and county of Murfield that is not going to be subtracted from the $3 million as we bring that project forward. So we'll be very clear about which projects are in and already accomplished or in, in conversation now, and which projects will be handing over to the Murfield Housing Authority to take on, as well as their funding. Additionally, you as city council um, or the city council of Winfield can always provide additional funding if, if your designation, you have that, that budgeting process. You have both the annual budgeting process that you'll be undertaking, part of it's occurring after this item. And then the supplemental budgeting process if there's a unique opportunity that you want to follow up on. And so we'll be able to, as a city council and as a city, respond to those opportunities and support the Winfield Housing Authority in that manner. It'll be your discretion. Again, it's through your budgeting process. Um, they will be allowed to, to collect, retain, utilize its own financial resources. I, I already mentioned grant opportunities. They will have potentially some ownership opportunities and potentially even build some units, at which point they'll be generating rent and other revenues. And so they'll be able to retain those and create, move toward financial independence. Um, and you just see that. And then finally, the, City and County Broomfield, it, and it's not as significant as many of you know, as you try to set up an office, uh, we'll be providing office space and meeting space for the housing authority as a whole, as well as the individuals they may hire. Um, we believe that there's likely to be one FTE in 2022. Um, if there's additional FTE, we'll obviously have to work through that. And that, that idea is, is we'll work with them to provide the adequate office space and make sure that they're, they're fully equipped and they are connected into our systems. Moving to the next slide, please. What they can be used for, I went through this last time when I made the presentation. They can be used for down payments, as an example, financial costs and due diligence, construction, if they move in that direction. Um, and so those are the primary goals that it can be used for, as well as their own operating expenses. Uh, and so those will be there. Um, they may use other funds that they receive and achieve within the guidelines of those funds. And so we aren't necessarily restricting them with the other funds that they may be seeking. Those grantors will provide particular restrictions or obligations related to those funds. Next slide, please. At the, at the um, study session, we discussed possible ways that we can, that we can formulate and create the, the authority. Um, with the board and then what the commissioners would look like. Again, after conversation and your input, 
Uh, and insight, um, it's five members is what we're proposing in the IGA. They'll be stated in four year terms. Those initial terms, the first two of those will be two year terms, and then the next three will be four year terms. Then at the end of two years, then the two will be replaced. Under state statute, we're required to have a revolving, kind of evolving uh, board. Um, so that's what we're doing it. And we chose at your uh, discretion or at your um, a suggestion we chose to match those up with the city council process and timing for appointing people to the board. So that's why we're using the two and the four years. So after that, they can be on for four year terms and um, they can be reappointed as many times as the city council chooses to do that and as many times as they're willing to um, volunteer their time and, and their heart and their energy um, to this process. The appointment process will be by the Burnfield City Council. We have tentatively scheduled for that for December 14th for, your, for the city council action for the appointment of those commissioners. We are recommending through this IGA and have in the IGA that, they, that the board members will be Winfield residents and they will be um, selected through an interview um, or an application and interview process, which we are working on now, um, finalizing uh, based upon what your, your direction would be tonight. Uh, based upon the conversation that you've had last time, we heard clearly that you wanted some geographic distribution of those members, and so we thought what made sense is, is um, not necessarily doing more designations, but in fact, doing that no more than three commissioners can come from a single ward. The idea is that way we see some representation across the community to be able to respond to that. Um, but the, the real key for bringing people onto this commission. Uh, we are suggesting is their knowledge and experience. And so the idea is that knowledge and experience is the overarching guideline that, that you city council may use to choose the individuals, but it's at your discretion what how to define what knowledge and experience is. Um, we are putting together an application now, um, but that the idea is, is that's the method to get the best outcome for the community. Um, additionally, we are suggesting, and you'll see that in the IJ, that our, one of our goals may be that someone, one of the commissioners would have a life experience. What that means is either it could be that they've been working in this area for a while and helping to bring that type of housing to the community, maybe as a developer, or maybe that they've lived in that, either currently or did live in it. So we're not requiring that, but we are suggesting that that is an important criteria in order to bring that breadth of experience into the commission. Finally, there was some conversation about how does the board and or the commissioners be removed. Um, the city council may remove any commissioner for inefficiency and neglect in this conflict. And that's clearly spelled out in the IGA. So you have the complete authority to remove somebody for any of those criteria um, at your discretion. Um, next slide, please. Structure and operations, the initial staff, um, the intent is the, the the Housing Authority Board will determine the point and contract for all staff. So they will make that appointment, um, hopefully in early January is the, the goal. Um, in the meantime, our Burnfield Housing Authority Executive Director, otherwise known as the City and County Manager of Burnfield, will serve as the Executive Director until that person is, is identified and, and obtained. That person will be, uh, because of what we have to do around our insurance policies, our behavior, our retirement policies and everything else, that person is going to be a city and county employee um, initially until we can work through that. And quite frankly, just to add a little bit of color to that, obviously we have negotiated uh, agreements with our with the people who provide us health insurance and other insurance, dental insurance and other things. They have to agree if they want to expand, expand that pool to include another organization like the Burnfield Housing so we can include them as city county employees, um, but we don't have the, the opportunity until we work with those um, seven, I think, organizations, private organizations to, to bring that forward. Uh, so that's the way that we've done it so that we can um, attract the best talent possible. Um, and that person will be assigned under um, Jennifer's designation. Uh, they will be assigned to report directly to and will serve at the will of the Central Housing Authority. Um, and so we structured that they'll act, they'll be in a similar capacity effectively to a department head within the city. So there's a particular structure and legality to all of that, which is beyond my capabilities. But luckily, as I mentioned, 
I spoke with four attorneys at one point, and that's what we were kind of grappling with. Um, the the, the um, executive director will report directly to the Bloomfield Housing Authority Board, as you can see. Additional staff will be determined by them, but in the meantime, City County Bloomfield will still have its housing its housing staff. Um, we will we have an existing staff member. We have a part-time staff member who's providing administrative, and then we have a consultant right now. Um, the intent is we will likely replace the consultant with a regular staff member. We're looking in that job description now. Um, they will work in conjunction and collaboration, but they will not work under the direct responsibility, direct oversight and guidance of the housing authority executive director. They will be two separate staffs. Uh, and they will continue to operate that. We will provide administrative support services, i.e., HR, IT, and some other services similar to that. Um, that, that quite frankly, are uh, cost prohibitive, perhaps for one individual member and a, and a small board uh, to be able to leverage. They will, Winfield Housing Authority will engage particular contract services, including financial, legal, and potentially grant administration fundraising as necessary. So the thought is they will have their own attorney, they will have a, someone doing their books, managing their accounts. We will not be doing it because we are a grant forward to them. Um, and they are our grantees. So we cannot manage the books for them and manage their accounts. So they will be separate. They will have their own banks and own bank accounts. Next slide, please. Reporting, the Housing Authority will produce on an annual basis a program of work. You'll note that we put dates in it, and the reason for the dates is it lines up with our budget side. Effectively. So by July 1st, they need to give us a draft. I think it's by October 1st, they need to give us a final program of work for the next year. That way, we can incorporate that in any way that we may want to in the budgeting process for city council to consider any additional funds. So, prior to a budget, there will be something that we'll be able to point to and say this is what they're doing. They will provide an annual report of activities and accomplishments. They will have an independent audit and they will complete all necessary reports to federal and state agencies, specifically the IRS. Um, because they'll have a certain designation. They have certain obligations and they must maintain those obligations. And our, we want to make sure it's very clear who reports those things to the IRS. Um, and, and so that becomes very important. This was the other question that was raised in it, one of the other questions raised in the study session is the ability to terminate um, this board and return it um, in whatever manner you want. So you can effectively terminate the relationship with the 90 day notice based upon obviously some mutual agreement. Um, and then what we have to do is decouple some of the items. So there will be some decoupling that will have to be done. We just can't close something out. You have to kind of methodically do it. So that's part of what the, that one is about. Um, and so you, the city council, will have that ability. Finally, last slide. And, and then I and my colleagues will be happy to take any questions. Um, and that is, is a rough timeline of how this lays out and what is coming um, moving forward. As you can see in it, the application process for commissioners, the review, um, uh, and, and you know, we will likely not actually. That was a typo that I had. We, we are going to have to review the application with HAC, but we will not review, they will not be reviewing the candidates because potentially, hopefully, some of them will be applying. So I apologize for that. Second bullet point in November should not say with HAC. Um, that was my, my error. Um, I'm in a, in a different place. Um, you will see that City Council selects the commissioners. Um, we will likely conduct both a second round of potential candidates. Um, and then um, their consultant, their legal consultant, um, we uh, at Obiet will begin working on initial bylaws and other documents in order to allow them to become effective on January 1st. We will likely have to public notice their organizational meeting. Their organizational meeting is tentatively scheduled for January 7th. At 10 a.m., and then we'll begin moving through those kinds of activities um, that will set it up. So, with that, um, I'm going to look at Bob McGrow as the theoretical applicant. Um, Bob, I don't know if you want to add anything to uh, this presentation or anything else you'd like to do. So, Bob McGrow again is the vice chair of the housing budget. Thank you, Jeff. I don't know if I can uh, follow the protocol of. Everyone but Mayor, Executive Director of the Housing Authority, Hoffman, Council Members, Commissioners. Thank you. Uh, no, I think the, the one point I want to make is that we have worked very diligently with staff to come up with this 
uh, roster of uh, work and so forth. It fits with what we're doing. Uh, currently, we all the members have been present uh, during all of the discussions. So the Housing Advisory Committee as a whole is fully engaged and committed to this process and, and undertaking. This is no small undertaking, as you can see, and it'll take a lot more work and so forth. And some of it is the uh, diligence work that you go through with accounting and uh, tax returns and so forth. And, some, and most of it, though, is the housing work. And I, I, what, the one point I want to make is that the plan that the Housing Advisory Committee has presented to the housing, uh, excuse me, to the city council and has been following for the last three plus, four plus years, will continue to be our, our primary focus in the housing work that we do. We will reach out to the community to gather more information, to get more um, details about what's necessary or needed uh, from community members. So we'll continue to expand on that to make sure that the plan we have in place and as we rotate it and make it more vibrant, it's covering the aspects that are most important to the community. And again, as I've said many times, this is, this is a, a resource change that allows us to, to continue to work on the continuum of housing, not just for the very poor, not just for workforce housing, it's for all sorts of uh, effective usages, including working with developers to create more affordable for sale housing, trying to re, uh, trying to create more financing opportunities for for sale housing, et cetera. We often think of the rental first. So I just on behalf of the advisory committee, I really want to step forward, put everybody on the line with me and say thank you very much for all this work. And we're here to continue the hard work. Thank you, Mr. Monroe. Mayor, board chair, that concludes our presentation. I'll turn it over to council. Thank you, Mr. Online. Well, uh, we're going to proceed with public comments next. If any member of the public would like to comment on this agenda item, please step up to the podium. Well, we have one person online, so we're going to go to the caller holding, James Holshin. You have three minutes. Hello. Hello. Okay. Good evening, uh, Mayor and City Council. Um, I am calling in um, to applaud the council on your hard work in getting this um, accomplished. Um, this is something that's obviously been a long time discussed and a long time coming. And we all know that affordable housing is a crisis in this, um, well, in the community, but also in the state. And, you know, this will give Broomfield the flexibility that we need to really move forward with addressing this issue in a comprehensive and systematic fashion, much more than we currently have with, um, you know, when, when Broomfield became a county 20 years ago, it made sense to have the city council as this housing authority. We're no longer that community anymore. We are much, much bigger. And now it is time to move forward with this um, to give our community what they need as far as um, moving forward with affordable housing. And I just wanted to call in to uh, tell you that you have my support and I appreciate um, um, the work that you've done on this. And I am, I didn't mention the end, but I'm a resident of Brandywine and um, I look forward to seeing this move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Questions from the board and council are next. Are there any comments or questions from the board? Member Shaft. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, so I just have uh, one question. It kind of goes to the last point that you uh, that uh, uh, Mr. Monroe made uh, regarding the uh, different points of you know that the board isn't just involved in the decisions regarding affordable housing, but really housing as a whole. And so I was curious, and this may not be a question for Mr. Monroe, but maybe for our attorney, um, is is our our with the board being involved in those conversations with developers? Is there any type of point that could be? Um, you know, because those developments are going to be quasi-judicial. Is there any going to be any, uh, going to be any complications with regard to those quasi-judicial decisions by council uh, with uh, conversations with the um, independent housing authority? 
Council member Schaap, I don't believe so because they will be an independent housing authority at that point. Um, and you are the body that's going to be adjudicating the quasi-judicial proceeding. So it actually helps in that regard. Okay, all right, great, that's all I have, thanks. Thank you, board member then. Um, I wondered, I uh, had a few questions about the specific language. In the um, section on initial appointments of commissioners, it says the initial board of commissioners is anticipated to include at least three commissioners who have served as members of um, Broomfield Housing Advisory Council. Um, the word anticipated um, grabbed my attention there. It didn't seem like a word you would use in a legal document, let's say. Um, the, um, so I wondered what the legal meaning of anticipated was. In the in the previous paragraph where we referred to the fact that they they refer that we preferred that it a commissioner had life experience, the word preferred was used. And then in this next paragraph, we're talking about anticipating that the commissioners include at least three commissioners who are who have been on VHAC. So what what was the intent there? I guess is my question. Board well, member Lim, I'll I'll, um, I'll take the first shot at that. Um, from the perspective, so there's seven on the um, advisory committee right now, um, and and so anticipating is less of a legal term and more of a term indicating to council and the community that the existing members continue to indicate that there is interest, that they will in fact be applying. So we anticipate that of the existing advisory committee, numerous of those individuals will apply to be on this. Okay, that explains the difference in the joint. Okay. Um, in the initial vesting grant section, 3.11, um, it says the granted funds will include specific programming programmatic outcomes, including but not limited to, and then it says supporting the 100 affordable dwelling units. So I was wondering if there will be other programmatic outcomes that will be required as part of the granting of the $3 million and beyond the 100 affordable units. And if so, when will we see those programmatic outcomes that will be required in addition to the 100 units? I'm going to take that one as well. Um, Board Member Lynn, when they, in the middle of the conversation, rather than having annual um, targeted metrics, this is really going to take a three year um, evolving process. So out of the gate um, with that 3 million, the first metric is going to be something that we can identify and track the needle, which is um, specific to the 30 to 60 AMI. So again, it's a measurable outcome um, from a program perspective, the independent housing authority um, from a workable perspective will look very different than it looks when it starts um, in that first month. So through the evolution of it, through council's ability to monitor um, annually, anytime that we're having these budget conversations, if they come um, seeking additional funds, um, part, of the, part of the charge is innovation. And, and so innovation in and of itself indicates that we're not going to be able to script for the next three years exactly what it is that we're going to measure. Okay, I that's helpful. Um, yeah, and I guess I just would like uh, wanted to comment that it'd be great. Uh, there is a reference in here to partnership with other boards and commissions, and certainly our discussions and basis with sustainability have been revolving around housing and equity with sustainability and how we want to partner with other boards. So, so thank you. Mm -hmm. Board member Hankel. Uh, 
Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for a brilliant work on this um, and in their housing committee and everything. I know that this is a lot of work and particularly a lot of legal work as well. I have two questions um, in looking at the IGA and looking at the city housing staff on 2.1.4. Um, I just kind of want to know where the liability is because you know when we separate this housing authority, um, you know, we're trying to limit liability to the city and county. And I just wanted to know what that looks like throughout that section where it says the city will retain its own staff to perform duties and assignments related to the support of the city's housing goals and work. And it sounds like we're going to be having some staff from the city and county, um, not just the executive director. So what does that look like as far as liability? And I'm not, I think that's a legal question. I'm going to take the first shot at it, um, Nancy. It's really, I mean, I mean again, initially it's, it's not a legal question. That's the that's that was one of the primary outcomes for having that independent housing authority was they were then assuming the liability. So in that paragraph um, and what you just read, I can understand how it, how it would be a little bit confusing. I, I think the point was from a staff perspective that the collaborative nature of what we're going to continue to do, which is why it's important initially for the um, the independent um, how the the executive director be staffed. Um, if, if we've discovered anything over the last two years, it's the importance of proximity. Um, back to board member uh, Lim's point on um, sustainability, understanding what the impact and or contributions um, from all of the other departments. So I think mean, Jeff was just trying to, to lay out that we're going to continue to have our own independent housing team that is separate from the housing authority. They will continue to work together, um, not share in liability, um, but simply a workspace um, and admin staff until the independent housing authority matures, whether it be a year and a half or two years, and then it's just under constant evaluation, but it's two very separate um, employee and structures, uh, board member. Okay, I would like to see the metrics on that. And when we, when we get there, I think that'll be a good you know, system to sort of evaluate. Um, my second question was about donations and growing in, in that sense. I believe that the Boulder um, Housing Authority has their own sort of foundation. So when people want to donate, is it a foundation that they are donating to, or what does that look like for someone to donate? Um, Mayor, uh, board chair, council members, and board members. Um, sorry, um, but it's, you know, I have to do this. Uh, it, it, so the organization itself will likely be obviously a nonprofit in the organization in that way. Um, so they'll have some limitations. They may decide it's in their interest at a particular time to create a foundation or some other apparatus um, and, and be able to utilize that to ship to bring money in um, in different ways. They will be independent of us, and so therefore they will be able to receive money in a different manner than we can right now. Um, as an example, from the Department of House, Colorado Department of Housing, or others, and so they may just be able to receive that money. But as far as the individual making a donation, you could do it, um, or we could create, as you point out, another entity in order to align and create greater fundraising activities. Okay, all right. So it sounds like it's such a housing authority. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem, Vice Chair Jaworski. Thank you, Mayor Chair, and whatever else. <laughs> so I have to have a couple of questions. The first one, um, the initial grant of three million that we are making to the this new housing authority. Just want to, I think I, we touched on this last time. I just want to state it again. This is funds that are that are already in the, the housing authority's account, and we're just transferring them to the new independent authority. Correct. Uh, All right, good enough. Yeah. Yes, okay. Yeah. So, the, the, so just want to make, make sure that was clear to everyone that the, these aren't separate funds. This is money that we already have allocated to, to housing matters. So the other question I have is regarding the, the removal of a housing authority member. That was something that that, that was important to me. I think important to a lot of my, my, my colleagues to make sure there's some oversight um, by, uh, by city council. And uh, I see that the criteria is for inefficiency, neglect, or misconduct. And those are kind of, I guess, vague terms. And uh, I did look at 294208, which is a state statute that um, is uh, referred to in our contract. And it doesn't really 
define it um, clearly at all, as far as I can tell. So I, my concern is I, mean, I don't want this to become a ever a political witch hunt, you know, for for the removal of someone. So I mean, do we have something we can point to that sort of gives some guidelines as to, as to what inefficiency or neglect or, or misconduct actually means? Unfortunately, Mayor Pro Tem, no. It would be very fact specific. So in that type of situation, we would want to um, provide council with sufficient information so that you could see the inefficiency in the record. We could see the disregard for the duty so that the determination to remove somebody from the housing authority would, wouldn't be arbitrary. It would be based on facts in the record. Okay. And the other thing I, I noticed that our agreement does say that a, a removal would, would be by city council. The, the statute talks about it being removal by the mayor. Um, with that conflict, I, I guess I'm assuming our agreements um, would, would uh, supersede this and it would be a city council decision. It would, it would be, and that was a very intentional change to give that power, power to the entire council. Okay. And then back to the, the first point, I, I did see that there, there is a process, so if there was going to be um, a removal, that there's a process where I think, as you mentioned, we would have to have a certain level of facts, and then the, the person who's being proposed to be removed would have an opportunity to, to have a hearing and state their case um, publicly, I'm assuming. And okay, so. Hopefully that, that would be enough to um, deter any, as you said, arbitrary or capricious removal. All right, I'll, I'll go with that. Thank you. Thank you. Another board member, board member Anderson. Thank you. And I think we may have been answered, but could you just cover quickly the oversight that I know we talked early on that console, city council can I give up the oversight that we always have oversight? We talked about we point the Board commissioners, if we're um, granting money, that would be some time we have oversight. But what if we're not in agreement on the metrics or something? Like, do we have other oversight over the housing authority? Governor keeps looking over at me, so I'll, I'll continue to uh, I'll continue to take these uh, until it feels compelled. Um, the oversight really is. Uh, like many things that we're, we're doing, um, board member, council member Anderson, um, and that is on the front end. And, and so the agreements that are in the IGA, um, and any time that there is any additional expenditures that um, or revenue that is being sought from city council, that initiates a whole different um, and additional review process. So. It's, it's never the intent, and it certainly isn't the intent from, from any of, of, of the board um, that indicates it's going to be a one and done, right? Just like when you have an employee, if you're having evaluation, you're having evaluations frequently, right? It's not a year in to where we kind of say, oh, they're not meeting the metrics. We're not going to give them the money this year. Um, again, the, the structure is such from a collaboration perspective, from a staff perspective, um, as well as the, the intricacies with regards to development. Um, meeting our matrix, meeting our other um, committee um, standards and goals, the oversight is going to be ongoing in that measuring those metrics from the uh, from from moving the needle perspective. Starting with those hundred units, it's going to be really clear where they are, how they're doing. Um, and, and additional support that may or, or may not be needed, whether it's financial or um, staff resources. Um, your question about if, in, if, if in fact, um, you know, the, the independent housing authority starts to go rogue, um, you can't legislate your way out of good policy or bad policy. So again, from, from the perspective of the IGA, the ongoing conversations, um, we've had conversations about the, the number of times that um, the Independent Housing Authority will be eager to come to council to uh, not only report on the metrics, but what's working, what is it, how, um, what grants are they seeing, um, and just kind of the, the health and, um, and well being as we move forward on it. Thank you. And just, just to be clear, I, I fully anticipate that it, the, the latter part though this is always be done very well and I think I think you're going rogue was 
<laughs> the term I was looking for. So you just have to keep that authority there, but I don't, I don't foresee that, but kind of a, Okay, thank you. That's all the questions I have. Thank you. Any other board member comments? Oh, well, I guess, yeah, questions. Any questions? I don't see any questions. Okay, there being no further questions, the public hearing is closed. Next is the Broomfield Housing Authority's consideration of proposed resolution number 2021-187-HA. Before I ask the clerk to read the resolution by title, I want to remind the Housing Authority that resolution 2021-187-HA is an intergovernmental agreement and requires two-thirds approval of the Broomfield Housing Authority. Will the clerk please read proposed resolution number 2021-187-HA by title. Resolution number 2021-187-HA authorizing and approving an intergovernmental agreement between the city and county of Broomfield and the Broomfield Housing Authority. Is there a motion for member Tessier? I would never ask. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we've got resolution number 2021-187-HA be adopted. Is there a second board member Hankel? Second. Is there any discussion? Board member uh, Jesse. Thank you. I, um, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Romine. Uh, thank you, Housing Advisory Committee. Um, I want to give an honorable mention to all of you here today, as well as some of um, those in the past, particularly David Manley. Um, I also want to thank my um, representative who partnered with me along these last five years, uh, Council Member Law Evans. Um, if you're out there listening, um, I am so grateful for your partnership, your incredibly thoughtful and questions and your suggestions and comments over the years. Um, I'm glad to have walked that path with you. Um, to my colleagues up here on the dais, I Thank you so much for your incredibly thoughtful and diligent questions. Your um, insights have brought us where we are today, um, and I couldn't be more grateful. The community, thank you for your patience as we get our ducks in a row. It has been an incredible journey. And I just want to say that we can't talk about housing without talking about our public health about our educational health, about our intellectual health, occupational health, physical, mental, emotional, financial health. If you think about it, housing intersects with every other priority. As Council Member Lim mentioned, we talked about transportation, sustainability, public health, safety, and welfare. All of this council's work and the previous councils have dedicated their lives to public health, safety, and welfare. And it's been an honor to serve up here. And it sounds like the Housing Authority will remove those liabilities that we were worried about. Um, it will forge new partnerships and uh, fill in the gaps that this community has um, had within the housing spectrum. Um, so that is all I will say for today. This has been a really incredible journey and um, I really am going to listen to the chariots of fire <laughs> <laughs> because this has been a marathon. I think an ultra marathon. So thank you. Thank you for your time. Of course. Any other board member comments or discussion? Board member Shan. I just want to put another uh, thank you out to the, the hard work of uh, previous councils and, and this council, and uh, as well as to our housing advisory committee, as well as our staff. Uh, to get this to this point, this is um, uh, one of those things that began before I was even on council. Um, that uh, the housing advisory uh, committee was set up, and uh, it has gone uh, a long way. And so um, we are at a, uh, a momentous opportunity to finally approve this. And uh, there's been a lot of people that have, have worked on this. So thank you to all of you. Thank you. Any other discussion? I just echo what was just said um, by my colleagues. Uh, will the clerk please call the roll? Room? Yes. 
Hinkle. Yes. Jazerski. Yes. Law Evans. Lim. Yes. Lindstedt. Yes. Schaff. Yes. Tessier. Yes. Anderson. Yes. Cohen. Yes. That passes unanimously. Congratulations. Next is Council's consideration of proposed resolution number 2021-182. Before I ask the clerk to read the title, I want to remind Council that resolution 2021-182 is an intergovernmental agreement and requires two-third approval of the City Council. Will the clerk please read proposed resolution number 2021-182 by title? Resolution number 2021-182, approving an intergovernmental agreement with the Housing Authority for the City and County of Broomfield, the Housing Authority, and approving the change in appointment of Housing Authority Commissioners and authorizing transfer of governing authority to an independent Housing Authority effective January 1st, 2022. Thank you. Is there a motion, Board Member Tessier? Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that resolution number 2021 182 be adopted. Is there a second, Board Member Hankel? Second. Is there any discussion? Yes. There is a Board Member Ted. Just a real quick, I would have uh, uh, been so mortified if I hadn't said a special thank you to Cheryl Sinclair and um, all of the, her, I don't want to say her, I want to say part of the <laughs> goddess power behind the the uh, where we are now so um, i'm so grateful for all of your work thank you very much thank you any other discussion would the clerk please call the roll Nicole? yes Jersey? yes lim yes linstead yes shaft yes tessier yes Anderson? Yes. Cohen? Yes. Broom? Yes. That passes unanimously as well. Thank you, everyone. The second item for the Housing Authority's consideration this evening is the public hearing for resident comments regarding the 2022 proposed budget. This item will be considered concurrently by the Housing Authority City Council, the Broomfield Urban Renewal Authority, and the Original Local Improvement District. That's all of us. The Rearfield Urban Renewal Authority was previously called to order, but I will now call to order the meeting of the Arista Local Improvement District. The meeting of the local <laughs> Arista Local Improvement District is called to order. I'll ask the clerk to call the roll for the Arista Local Improvement District. Anderson? Here. Cullen? Yes, here. Broom? Here. Pinkle? Here. Chazerski? Here. Law Evans? Lim? Here. Lindstedt? Here. Shaft? Here. Tessier? Here. Thank you. I'll now declare the public hearing open. We'll follow the city standard public hearing procedures as previously outlined. We'll now review items 10B, 11B, 15B, and 16A concurrently. Council and board members have a copy of the agenda memorandum, which I'll ask our staff to summarize. Thank you, Mayor. Chief Financial Officer Brenda Ritchie um, and her entire um, new budget team is here supporting her night tonight, so um, it's awfully good to look out and, and see uh, the entire team here. I don't think we've seen that before, so thank you. And Ms. Ritchie. Thank you, City Manager Hoffman, and appreciate the staff being here as well. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, members of the council, members of the board, uh, members of the authority commission, maybe. Uh, hopefully that covers it all. Brenda Ritchie, Chief Financial Officer, here to present the balanced proposed 2022 budgets for the Housing Authority, Arista Limited Improvement District, Broomfield Urban Renewal Authority, and the City and County of Broomfield. Um, staff has made copies available on our website as well as provided that um, in publication for uh, the public as well as Council on September 10th and um, have held discussions throughout the year, either in the form of a study session, council meeting, or budget workshops. Um, and this budget really reflects the operating and capital expenditures that are contained in those comprehensive documents. So next slide, please. Perfect timing, we're gonna start with the Broomfield Housing Authority. And as Mayor Pro Tem Jazerski uh, had mentioned that this budget actually had previously existed. So uh, the reflections of the changes that would occur from the independent board or any decisions thereafter this evening uh, from the IGA would really be reflected in any budget amendment that would move forward. 
the decisions that were made. So what we can expect from the housing um, a, a development fund in terms of revenues is really an increase. And I, I do want to point out that there is a discrepancy in the table versus the memo. It was uh, the tables were done prior to additional revenues being allocated from developer contributions. So it's actually favorable for the Housing Authority Fund. We will see an increase in that contribution from private um, those private contributions. So that is a decrease. And then the other side of this on the expenditure side, they might seem lower than anticipated. And just as a reminder, every year, um, so we'll take a step back. We uh, the Housing Authority receives quite a few grants. And the timing of the state, federal, Broomfield's fiscal year are three different timelines. So what we typically do is in the beginning of the next of fiscal year is do a grant and uh, capital improvement project rollover. So those expenditures will be reflected there and then we're closely aligned with the revenues at that time. So that actually, uh, next slide please. Here we have the uh, RISTA Limited Improvement District. And so these are very dedicated funds really established to facilitate the construction and transportation transportation facilities in the Arista area. And therefore funding can only support those initiatives. It's based on that sales tax that are collected. And as you see here, it's to support those revenue um, event center parking structure bonds that were initially done. And it's a straight in and out collection. So that's why it's a 50-50 split. So what we anticipate in Collections for 2022 is approximately 23,000 of that uh, 0.2 sales tax for those um, those taxable sales within the within the district, and then those will go right back out uh, to support those bond payments. Next slide, please. So here we have the Broomfield Urban Renewal Area, and the authority finances various improvement projects within those boundaries and are funded through tax revenues such as sales, property tax, and those incremental revenue sales. Projected in the 2022 budget, uh, Borough is expected to see a 13% increase in revenues and conversely a 21% increase in expenditures. Despite the increase in expenditures, um, you're gonna see that is related to, for example, the baseline area. Uh, further development is occurring. However, uh, URAs are committed to be remaining strong and a viable asset. Uh, to Broomfield. And as an example, in the shopping area west of 120th and Sheridan, we're really looking to see additional large growth within that area. And as you see for um, the revenues and expenditures, the expenditures are still lower than the revenues coming in. Next slide, please. This brings us to the city and county of Broomfield um, and our proposed budget for 2022. Uh, the uh, I want to just point out, I know we're not talking about the 2021 revised this evening, however, the large um, increase for the 2021 revised is a, is a direct relation, um, reflection, excuse me, of the Windy Gap debt service that was incorporated. So it's, it shows the bond payments that uh, we received and that um, the in and out related to those expenditures. There, there are some additional rev revisions that we'll talk about um, in the coming weeks, but related to the 2021 revised, but that's why you see a large jump. In 2022, um, we see that there are several key factors that are influencing our 2022 budget, aside from the pandemic. So those are gonna be increases related to our insurance premium. And that's a majority of them. And it's not just our healthcare insurance, but also our property and casualty liability insurance claims. Uh, we're seeing which directly impacts our operating costs as well. And as you've heard throughout the year, along with um, our economic outlooks and discussions from my colleague, Mr. Romine, uh, talking about the inflationary costs on goods and services. And so that's also reflected here. We don't anticipate those pressures on the supply and demand to decrease. It's actually going to continue on through 2022. So it's gonna force that um, demand of that supply chain, which increase again, our operating costs. Another area um, that we see a growth in our expenditures is really directly related to our greatest asset, which is our staff. And so I know that there's been conversations that the council has directed, and we're really looking at that compensation philosophy, which I'll talk about here in a few, a few slides. But in order to provide the services that the community has grown to um, expect and, and what we need to provide in terms of programs and services, the costs are increasing, but so does the uh, need for staff to be able to support those programs. And so with the rising cost of whether it's additional staff, it's also the cost of staff as well. Um, and it's our commitment to 
excuse me, investing in ourselves. <clears throat> so, sorry, there's um, also a lot of changes related to le legislative and general mandates. Uh, a couple of those that we see typically is in terms of water quality, for example, federal mandates uh, dictating those levels and ensuring that we're keeping up with that. So we're providing safe and healthy drinking water to um, the customers of Broomfield, as well as uh, legislative changes related to property taxes, another large one that we saw this year. So I'll, I'll talk about that. Actually, if you move on to our next slide, is looking at our revenue. This is a breakdown of how we look at um, our majority is charges for services. But as you see, we've got taxes, sales use, and property tax, and then other obligations that areas of revenue that we receive. So um, if you take a look at this slide, we typically, Broomfield's charges for services is the largest amount. And in the preliminary estimates for our charges for services, so that's going to include your water um, utilities, those fees and licenses associated with that. We did preliminarily include a 2% and 2.5% increase related to those, respectively, for sewer and water. However, we're not um, proposing an ordinance until, as, as you know, we're in the process of conducting our, <clears throat> excuse me, a utility rate study. So in the process of that, we'll continue to analyze and do the same methodology, work with our consultant, come back to the community, as well as um, council, and for further direction and approval regarding those ordinances. We anticipate that we will do that in the beginning of January of 2022. And the interim will continue to provide updates to the council. Another major source of Broomfield revenues is property taxes, as mentioned, and it's really 25% is what Broomfield collects. The other remaining portion is really collected for other districts. So whether that be school, um, special districts, Broomfield only collects 25% of that property tax bill. Um, staff is monitoring. There's been, again, a lot of initiatives uh, projected for legislation and per being proposed currently and have already passed, one of that being Senate Bill 21293. We, what um, staff has done was reduce the 2022 property tax budget to reflect that after further evaluation and interpretation of the um, passage of that enactment of that bill, it's been determined that that should take effect actually in 2023. So it works in Broomfield's favor. Um, staff will continue to work with our legal counsel as well as, <clears throat> as, well as our um, assessor's office to determine the best way to approach that and include that in our budget. But we'll see that in a revise to clean that up. But again, it works in Broomfield's favor is the, is the fact that we reduced the budget by that $3 million. However, we anticipate that that will go on, um, only be impacted beginning in 2023. We'll still monitor um, November's ballot initiative related to the property tax and, and have those discussions if those come up as well. Um, next slide, please. So looking conversely at the expenditures, um, I've covered a lot of the majority of the influences that are key drivers. This is just to really highlight our overall um, connection between operating capital and then again, our um, general obligations such as our debt service with um, lease payments, and then our continued commitment to contribute to our reserves. So we are um, continuing to reserve, excuse me, contribute more than the minimum policy of our 10%. So we're contributing approximately 4 million into our reserves to ensure that we remain fiscally viable in, in the years going ahead. Um, next slide, please. So as I mentioned, personnel is, um, costs have been rising and, uh, and our continued commitment. Here we see from 2019 to 2022 what we're projecting. A majority of those um, increases are related to the other benefits as well as salary. So there's been conversation, council has directed to look into the compensation philosophy and making those adjustments. I can say that our 2022 budget does uh, include the 3% merit pool for employees as well as market adjustments. What it does not include is the analysis yet that it has yet to be done on um, that compensation of looking at raising it to rather than the 50th percentile to the 60th percentile, 60 percentile. So, um, we'll continue to work on that, come back to council with the, that information as we have it. And again, it's just going to continue to support. The other aspect is the addition of positions. So there is a quite a number of positions that were added in 2021 as well as 2022. So you'll see that reflected because um, 
partway through this current fiscal year, there's probably 20 positions that have been added, you'll see the full fiscal year impact in 2022. So that's where if you're questioning why there's such a large increase, that would be um, why that is. Next slide, please. And so this is just a high level expense by category of our capital expenditures, because again, our budget contains both operating and capital. And as you see here, it's broken out by our various um, water, transportation, development agreements. Those are going to be, not surprisingly, our, our top expenditures. Uh, more detail is found in our CIP uh, five-year outlook, and again, um, anticipating how we'll move forward in the years. And that, uh, next slide, please. That actually wraps up the high-level overview. Is really just to illustrate, again, basically the conversations we've had throughout the year to, have, to discuss the proposed budget, how we're maintaining a fiscal, fiscally conservative approach, and we move into 2022 and beyond. Um, what we have coming up is going to be, we look forward to the comments from the public this evening, as well as uh, council, board, authority, um, whatnot, and then uh, making administrative uh, amendments, meaning minor changes, just to help clarify the budget in, in the process from now until the budget is adopted in two weeks when we propose both the 2021 and the 2022 budgets. So with that concludes my presentation and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Ritchie. We'll now proceed with public comments. We'll start with in-person public comment. If there's anyone who would like to speak on this agenda item, please step up to the podium, uh, state your name and neighborhood for the record, and please limit your comments to three minutes. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. My name is Jan Billsborough. I live in the Redleaf neighborhood. I'd like to respectfully share that the budget process is currently being rushed and the city budget shows 25 new general government positions over the two year period. And so when we look at the budget being rushed, Reflecting on what has just been said by Ms. Ritchie, we have property tax income that's significantly lower than what should be in the budget document you're considering. And so the process you've established with the material coming to you so rapidly means that the figures that are being used are not fully up to date. For example, my city and county taxes will increase by 11%. And I think it's respectful to all property tax owners taxpayers to include their increased taxes in the budget. In addition, the timing relates to the fact that next week you'll have a study session to consider strategic priorities. That really should come before the process of the dollars that relate to that. So you'll be talking about personnel in that regard. You've talked tonight about personnel related to housing and such. Those figures all need to be in the budget you officially adopt. Rather than waiting until the spring for significant changes, that doesn't allow for the most comprehensive consideration by you all of budgetary issues and the decisions you need to make. I think taxpayers deserve a better process. So I would suggest that you delay the budget approval until the revenue figures can be updated, the housing uh, uh, personnel, the personnel you may consider next week, related to strategic planning, all of that be put together in a document so you have the full picture, including the revised budget figures, which you've seen just briefly highlighted here at a high level. That would be my recommendation. Um, the budget also moves, this three, moves three and a half FTEs from the Capital Improvements Fund to the General Fund. And I'm curious why you're making that shift. I see I'm running out of time. On the expense side, there are 43 new positions in 2022 compared to 2020. And if you exclude um, parks, recreation, and senior services, because those areas have fluctuated quite a bit because of the pandemic and the impact on staffing. Some positions, of course, need to increase because of population growth and new subdivisions. When I do all the puts and takes on that, I get roughly 25 positions that you've increased in two years in what I would call general government functions. This compares 
to businesses which have closed, cut back on personnel, residents have trimmed their own budgets. So is it fair to taxpayers that city overhead positions have grown this much? Thank you so much for your consideration. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna let Ms. Richie address any of them that she would like to. I can, if you'd like to. I'm happy to fill in the gaps as well. Okay. And, uh, Brenda, talk a little bit about, um, um, and thank you for those those questions. We we appreciate it. Um, the budget process has, has been a, a work in progress over the last um, three years. Um, to, Ms. Ritchie, talk a little bit about how many times the budget comes back before council, so it's, it's not a one and done. And the reconciliation piece, um, talk a little bit about uh, that as well, and then we'll talk uh, about the positions. Sure, absolutely. And again, thank you for those comments uh, on the budget. So just to take a step back, the budget is a, a planning document. Also, it's a fluid process. So um, as City Manager Hoffman indicated, it's not a one and done. We've had conversations with the council, with the community throughout the year uh, to discuss initiatives or projects and the funding associated with that. Um, we continue to have amendment, what we call budget amendments. So during that process, we have the ability to reconcile. The reason we have a, a revision on the um, fiscal year, the beginning of the fiscal year, is, is to account for a couple of things. One, to ensure that we have closed books accordingly. So our projections reconcile with the amount of funds that we had projected and anticipated, and, and to ensure that we have properly started our beginning fund balance of the next fiscal year. The other element of that is to incorporate any changes that might occur during the operational, um, uh, during any changes that happen throughout the years. We saw last year of, and still um, experiencing the impacts of the pandemic, we needed to make sure that we weren't overly over projecting um, any of our revenues and or over projecting our expenditures as well, because that would put us put Broomfield in a um, in, in a negative fiscal state. So we ensure that by, by taking these various amendments throughout the year, reconciling, ensuring that that process is met. Um, in terms of the CIP, I'd have to look at those positions. Um, and then in the property tax uh, valuation, not valuation, excuse me, the, the $3 million that was under budgeted, um, that was reduced from the budget as a reflection of the Senate bill um, 291, I don't, I believe that's it, 293, okay, um, sorry, uh, that was just an interpretation. We've gotten clarification that it really does actually happen in 2023, would it impact our 2023 budget, therefore we will go back and, and make those adjustments. But again, because it's a planning tool and a document, it, it's to really set the authority to spend. It by no means it allows us to have parameters in which our the budget provides those parameters and guidelines. That can help. It does. And I think that's the from, from a community perspective, those are really the tangible conversations that when we think of a budget, um, when we think of a household budget, um, that budget is not locked in stone. Again, it is a it's a planning document. So if your income reduces or if your income increases. Then that does you don't wait until the whole next year in order for those adjustments and amendments to be made. Um, and, and just a couple other things as well. Um, in the budget workshops that 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 we've been doing um, annually, it's a great place to kind of get that uh, the thirty thousand foot, and by the end you should be at the fifteen thousand foot. Um, and part of the conversation that we have is um, oftentimes when because it says the city and county of Broomfield on your property tax check. For the services that Broomfield provides, they are at a platinum level. Um, our surrounding communities do not provide the same level of services nor um, acclimate to uh, from a responsiveness perspective. So per rooftop in Broomfield, the services cost the city and county of Broomfield about $3,000. That's without inflation or adjustments. Um, when you write the property tax 
The majority of it goes to the schools. Some of it, depending upon where you live, go to the metro districts. And about an average of 1,300 comes to the city and county of Broomfield to pay for the services that cost 3,000 per rooftop. That gap that you're looking at between 1,300 on average and 3,000 per rooftop for those services, that's a significant gap. That gap continues to grow. So this council is charged, as are all councils, um, setting the policy to determine, and another thing reflected in the budget is revenues are flat. Revenues have been flat. We are fortunate in that they have not decreased for us um, from, a, from a totality perspective. But when your revenues are flat, your costs are increasing and your service level remains high, there's only a few things, it's, it's, pretty, it's a simple equation. You either reduce the service level, you increase the taxes, or you cut from a, a, a across the board perspective on spending, actuation, and your CIP projects. So again, it's, it's, that, it's, it's the interesting dichotomy between when things continue to increase and get more expensive, uh, when we were in COVID, we eliminated 22 positions. We were already 12% under per population. Broomfield's the fastest growing county in the state of Colorado. We have always prided ourselves on being me, me, me. Sounds great. Residents love it. Staff doesn't. That is a very difficult, it's very difficult to maintain that level of high service with a, with, a, with a number of staff, with an increased number of service level expectations. So um, on, the, on, the, on, the increasing of, on the increase of staff, we still, we, had, we were 12% behind where we should have been when we look at 2012 budgets. We also look at the number of employees that we had in 2012, including the complexity, um, and the increased populations, 12% under. We're now 8% under with the adjustments that council will review for the 2021 revised budget on the 26th. So we continue to be not far under, but significantly under in those areas that make it extremely difficult for staff to continue to be committed to provide those high level of services that we've all become accustomed to. So as we move through 2022, 2023, 2024, those are very difficult conversations to have. And to the residents, uh, to the residents' point, when we have when we have prioritization conversations on services that the communities become accustomed to, the line item of, of if you have a finite pot of money, how are you going to pay for these line items? And how do you prioritize it? So adding additional items requires that stringent eye because something has to go. You can't continue to add those line items. Does it have anything to do with being fiscally, fiscally conservative? Excuse me, but rather it has everything to do with the cost for personnel are going to continue to go up, particularly with the compensation philosophy. We're fortunate in Broomfield. Our turnover rate is extremely low. Um, we are fully staffed in the majority of our departments, including our police department, um, which is unheard of for any other community um, that is uh, surrounding us. To the extent that the majority of them are 35% and higher below staffing levels. So uh, again, it's a totality of circumstances. It's not just about compensation. It's about a whole host of other things, um, but it is absolutely reflected in the budget. Thank you, Minister Halpin. Are there any other public comments on this item? Well, then we'll go to uh, Council Member Board comment. Questions, if any? 
I'm not seeing any. That's cool. There being no further questions, the public hearing is closed. Thank you for the presentation and the feedback. Uh, this evening, Council will review the budget for final approval on October 26th at the, the regular Council meeting. Seeing there's no further business before the Broomfield Housing Authority, this meeting is adjourned. It's 7.50, so I'll go through these next two items and then we'll take our break. Items 11A and 11B were reviewed earlier this evening with items 10A and 10B, respectively, under the housing authority. So we're going to go ahead and take our 10-minute break at 7.51. Um, we'll be back at 8.01. Thank you. The Access Live event is in Music Hold.
music hold ended. One. Next is the public hearing and council consideration of resolution numbers 2021-160 and 2021-170 pertaining to Flatiron Crossing development. I'll declare the public hearing open. We will follow the city's standard public hearing procedures as previously outlined. Council has a copy of the agenda memorandum, which I'll ask our staff to summarize. Thank you, Mayor. And as excited um, as um, Councilmember Tessier and, and the others were for the Housing Authority, um, this is the equivalent uh, for staff of how excited we are. For, uh, <laughs> um, Anna Burton Zetti, Director of Planning and um, uh, Thunder Row Mine, will again walk us through this item. And um, our Flatiron partners are here. and. And I must say, they've, they've, they've just been stellar to work with. And the turnaround time from our last council meeting in order to have this deal financially before you all um, this quickly was, was yeoman's work. And uh, with that, Ms. Burton Zeddy, let's, let's ask council to close this deal, please. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, Mayor. Uh, City Council, too gracious. That was such an introduction, I'm apparently without words. So, Anna Burton Zetti, Planning Director and Co-Director for Community Development, if we could have the next slide. So, the subject site that we're all familiar with is the Flatter and Crossing Mall. This is southwest of US 36 in Interlocking Loop. The property is about 150 acres. And in the near term, um, the reinvestment will focus on a smaller area of this overall site, probably about 25 to 35 acres. 
The property is owned PUD and has been serving Burnfield as a, and the greater metro area as a regional shopping district for about 20 years. Next slide, please. Uh, this map is showing the location within a portion of the Burnfield Comprehensive Plan. The property is designated as regional commercial. This land use designation is identified as appropriate for regional shopping, travel, commercial, entertainment, and residential. These, use, these areas are intended to allow the greatest flexibility in uses and site design to promote innovative and economic development. The proposal is consistent with this intended regional commercial vision for the area. Next slide, please. As was mentioned, Flatiron Crossing has been serving this region for approximately 20 years with retail, dining, and entertainment uses. Flatiron Crossing provides about 20% of the retail sales and use tax collections in a typical year for Brookfield. Although the owner has continued to invest into the property over the last decade, the owner has now determined that it's the right time to propose this major reinvestment into the property to enhance the center and further energize the shopping area. Next slide, please. The application for consideration this evening is a PUD amendment. The PUD amendment establishes the standards that the future site development plans will be required to follow. This includes establishing design standards and the specific uses. The PUD amendment will allow 750 residential uses as well as the allowed commercial uses. The applicant is also asking to increase the height from 86 feet to 135 feet. There are variances being requested to allow reductions in the open area and parking stall dimensions. Parking stall dimension uh, reductions are not uncommon when we are considering future structured parking. And in regard to open area, a reduction of 40% for residential to 25%, again, for non-residential um, and for residential combined to 25% um, is not uncommon when we're talking about high density um, mixed use areas. Um, we have similar in Arista as well as in baseline. The applicant has committed to 20% of the rental units to be provided at 80% AMI. And the exact details for the establishment um, of the affordable units will be as, um, done when a residential developer brings forward a site development plan in the future. Finally, the PUD plan this evening is establishing the overall project and how it will meet the public land dedication. Um, the applicant is proposing to meet it through a 2.1 acre land dedication, a 6.4 acre credit for land development that was previously dedicated for Bar Park, and a waiver of the estimated 1.4 million cash in new. The private open land amenities and opportunities will be reviewed in more detail with individual site development plans for, re for the redevelopment that are, will be considered in the future. And with that, um, I will ask Jeff Romine to review some of the financial considerations. Mayor, per, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, Council Members, uh, City Council Manager Hoffman. So next slide, please. Um, obviously, as, as Anna already pointed out, there's about a 20-year, excuse me, I'm just going to take this up until I hear myself a moment. Um, there's a 20-year legacy that's related to this uh, development. It has been successful and producing income and revenue for the city for a number of years. Um, during the period in which it was originally developed, or originally proposed and developed, the City of County Bloomfield committed $81.3 million to support that development. As you will note in the third bullet point, we've received roughly a 3-1 return or roughly $250 million in additional revenue to the city uh, through this development, of which, and I just point this out just because of the uh, open space and land uh, conversation, that that, that revenue has been about $15.6 million going to that particular fund. The, the legacy, though, is, is through some decisions that were made, we still owe roughly $53.2 million of that uh, committed 81.3. Um, it's part of the, what's called 2012 A bonds, um, as referenced both in the, in the memo as well as the material that we provided in the past. It's expected to be paid off and scheduled to be paid off in 2031. Um, and so those, those revenues um, still need to be met, and, and we have that obligation still. Next slide, please. Anna pointed out all the benefits. Uh, the one that, that the couple that I just really wanted to, to emphasize is uh, threefold. One is, is that we expect through this redevelopment, 
uh, or the reinvestment and the, the redevelopment of a portion of the land, we expect roughly $350 million of additional investment going into this um, particular site in this particular area. That's a minimum. Um, and, and, and what we anticipate from working with our with the development partner um, as they've been looking at this, there may be additional redevelopment that may occur or some other things that may happen, but this is what we've, we felt was the right number to represent uh, what, what's coming forward. Um, additionally, the real key, at least from the way we've looked at it from an economic outcome, is, is it creates that 18 hour place. And that 18 hour place becomes critically important to the success. And you can think of some of those when you travel around other cities, and other metropolitan areas. The closest example here in, metro, in this metropolitan area, quite frankly, is Cherry Creek North and Cherry Creek. And that creates that 18 hour place a place where people live, where there's primary jobs as well as retail jobs, and there's a fair amount of activity going on. That would be what this would look like, perhaps to a different scale, um, but it gives you some sense of how these things fit together, um, and it is not a traditional shopping center area. Finally, the last thing that I would just point out is, of course, the impact on the long range financial plan. I talked about what that investment would be. We've also looked at it from the standpoint of what the revenue runs would look like based upon the expected developments and the expected outcomes of those developments. And it once again, it, uh, results in a positive financial revenue run for the city for the next 15 to 16 years. And likely as many as you've asked in some of your previous questions, far beyond that because of some of the other activity that will be going on there. But that's the way that we looked at it was trying to isolate it down to effectively the investment cycle as well as the retail and shopping and the entertainment cycle. Next slide, please. Um, it, specifically to the agreement uh, that's in, within your packet, it talks about exactly how we're putting this together. Um, as uh, Ms. Hoffman pointed out, it, it um, was a, uh, a bit of a conversation back and forth. We worked through a number of key points. Uh, both parties um, brought their best forward and tried to anticipate exactly what a minimum, since this is a contract and agreement, what the minimum was going to be within it, and also trying to ensure there's a degree of flexibility. One of those key points, of course, is that, that you may notice is that we do call for the ability of the developer um, in working with us to perhaps redevelop the Nordstrom property um, it, on the office side prior to bringing the office on the southwest side. We anticipate that both will occur, but we recognize we also want to create a real energy and a real excitement and that US 36 front door becomes critically important to the long-term success. So we wanted to add that flexibility within it. We have, a, we have a set set of contributions that we made over the next uh, 16 years. It's $49.9 million in, in, in uh, real terms. Um, and those are obviously um, be, being uh, spent over the period of time. As we've discussed with you in executive session, we worked through and thought about what the cash flow would look like. And so you'll see that they're somewhat backloaded um, onto the later years of the agreement um, with an increasing level of incentive payments being made in the later years. Uh, based upon performance and other outcomes. Um, uh, additionally, within the agreement, it shows the waterfall, which we talked about is how the revenue which we collect, we will put it into a, a, a designated account, and then the money will flow out. The first money out the door um, each year will go toward the bond payment. Um, again, the bond payment is actually greater than the level of the, of the flat irons portion of it, it's, that represents about 80% of the outstanding bond. So, but it, that first 80, that, that money coming out of this account will go toward making that bond payment, um, that 80% of the bond payment. Um, and so it provides us the security in order to move forward and making sure that we get our obligations um, paid off in a timely and effective manner. Um, and again, that bond will be paid off in 2031 is the schedule for it. Um, and again, the other part within this is you will see this is. One of the things that we made sure was in this agreement and our partners wanted to make sure in this agreement was what are all of those potential delays, the accelerations, the termination provisions, all of those have been added in to talk about it. And so what we do is have a very fluid and, and a positive agreement that we can live with. Hopefully we'll not have to uh, come in for some sort of amendment. Um, so as an example, what we just are going through, still in the process of, which is the pandemic effects on the revenues, um, that has been incorporated and thought through as part of this agreement. So if there's another 
similar type of event or another economic hardship, we talk about how that will be handled um, so that we don't go into negative cash flow in that particular year due to an obligation, but allows us to move forward. To that point, um, and it's very specific within the agreement and our partners understand that, is, is we have a maximum annual level that we will pay of 25%. Therefore, if you recall that the current development that we're, we've been in has returned us roughly $3 for every dollar that we invested. This will return us $4 for every dollar we invested. We take that because it's, it's very important for us to be financial stewards and appropriately make sure that we're getting the returns and the outcomes that we're looking for. On that, I will turn it back over to my colleague, Anna, to complete the presentation. Thank you very much. We can have the next slide, please. Thank you. So the Land Use Review Commission um, reviewed this proposal and recommended approval. There were um, two conditions that, or the, there were some changes requested to the plans that the applicant has addressed those related to the open area and to the height. The applicant also presented their proposal regarding affordable housing to the, and their public land dedication to the open lands trails. Um, and advisory committee to HAC, to PRSAC, um, during the, their respective meetings in June earlier this year. Um, HAC did not recommend approval of this affordable housing proposal because it didn't comply with the inclusionary housing ordinance. PRSAC indicated that they would not be opposed to waiving the public land dedication cash in lieu fee once they understood, um, understand the, the return on investment for Burnfield. OSTAC generally supported the open space and trails staff with their comments on the proposal, which were to incorporate trail, bike, um, and park lands um, enhancements. And the committee members emphasized that enhancements to bike and pedestrian circulation were very important. And that further discussion regarding the public land education could occur in the future and should occur in the future as site development plans are proposed. The committees and staff recognize the importance of ladder crossing to the economic health to Burnfield and expect to continue to work with the developer on a holistic approach to address the city ordinances, the standards and guidelines for development while recognizing the developer's significant, uh, excuse me, significant existing and planned investment to reimagine the whole. The staff did not identify any key issues with this proposal as um, noted on the screen and in staff's memorandum. We can have the final slide, please. The applicant did meet requirements for the neighborhood meeting as well as public notices. Um, it, the concept review was held in July um, and public notice requirements were met for this meeting this evening. That concludes staff's presentation. Um, we are here to and happy to answer any questions that you may have. The applicant also has a brief presentation prepared as well. Thank you. Next is the applicant presentation. Just as we ask the staff to keep their presentations brief, I ask the applicant to be concise in their application, their presentation. Will the applicant's representative please identify themselves for the record prior to beginning their brief presentation this evening? Good evening. My name is Jacob Knudsen with Maceridge, owner of Flatiron Crossing Mall, uh, address 11411 North Tatum Boulevard, Phoenix, Arizona, 85028. We're excited to be here tonight. Um, echo all the comments that have been previously said. Um, we want to. I want to thank the city and county group bill staff, committees, uh, and council for all the hard work and partnership. It's taken a lot of collaboration, a lot of hard work, especially over the last few weeks to get to the point where we're at right now. And we're all very excited. So we're looking forward to this major milestone for Flatiron Crossing that sets the stage for evolving the vision of the mall. As we bring the Broomfield Re community an exciting shop work with play experience, uh, as Jeff pointed out, really extending uh, from a, a six to eight hour day to an 18 hour day that will uh, enhance our dominant core retail asset. So we do have a, a presentation prepared. Uh, this is the same presentation that we've, we've shared with council um, and the committees over the last few months with the exception, as Anna noted, that we have modified it uh, to include the conditions that the Land Use Review Commission put on us um, that we have accepted. And so I was not planning to go into detail um, of the presentation, but we have it here and happy to reference it with any uh, questions or comments that council has. So with that, thank you for your time. Again, I appreciate everyone's time, collaboration and partnership we've had to get to this point and we appreciate your consideration. Thank you. 
So that concludes your presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Show you. Well, thank you very much. We'll now proceed with public comments. Does any member of the public have comments on this agenda item? If so, step up to the podium. And I'm not seeing any online as well. So, questions from City Council are next. Members should limit themselves to questions during this portion. The time to introduce amendments and state positions for or against this item is later. Are there any questions from Council? Councilmember Brew? Thank you very much. Um, and I have to say, uh, kudos to staff for walking us through this for the past several months. You guys have been amazing. So we can get to this very complex topic. Um, uh, everything that we've gone through in the background has been phenomenal. I did have some follow-up questions and some questions just for public orient orientation only. Um, just to clarify, the, we've got 53 million left in outstanding bonds, the 2021A, and then Broomfield's financial commitment to the program is another 50 million. So we're looking at a total of 100 million. Mayor, Council Members, Council Member that's, that's exactly right, roughly $102 million. Perfect, thank you. And, and then uh, based on that, a hundred million dollar investment, and we've got a, we've got a lot of investments on there right now, especially with the um, bond that we just went through for the reservoir. Um, what is our risks to this hundred million? I know you said the model is performing a three to one ratio. What happens if it doesn't? What where are we at if it goes to down to two to one or um, brick and mortar? doesn't perform as well as we think it's going to over the next 20, 25 years. Sure. Mayor, uh, Mayor for attending members of council. Council member, perhaps I, was, I should be a little bit precise in my response to your earlier question. That is, is there's roughly $50 million in this particular agreement. The $53 million that we have outstanding is actually up against the general sales, sales and use tax. Um, and so it's backed by that. So if for whatever reason, so let's go into your worst case scenario, I, I guess is the best way to answer that. We would still owe that $53 million. If the mall were to close tomorrow and we were to receive no more property tax, sales tax, or others, we still have an obligation to pay off the $53 million. Secondly, though, and I think more, more uh, responsive to your question then is, is what, what do we look at going forward? First off, is we have a termination clause, which represents what happens if the mall were to effectively shut down. Then we would not be obligated on the $49.9 million or whatever portion is still outstanding. If it slows down, that is the 25% cap side. So, what we end up doing is, is we've created a situation and, and working with research, um, created a situation that gave us those caps on both sides. Um, obviously, they do not intend for this property to close down, and they are going to do everything possible to keep it performing for them because it's an asset for that corporation also. So we are working forward. I, I would say that one part of this that becomes critically important, and perhaps it is a little bit of a, of how you, how you con convey into the marketplace, what the aspirations and what the direction is. By making this investment, both we, the city, as well as research, we are telling their other partners, their tenants, and some of the other folks that are partners in the Flatirons uh, Crossing development, who have independent property, that we are already investing in it. And so hopefully that will also spur their additional investment. So I think we've managed the downside risk and we've tried to create into the positive marketplace to say, this is one of those retail centers that will be strong going forward. Um, and so that's the best, I, I think that provides the best answer. Great, thank you. Um, Council Member Ruben, I just wanted to add, that we have a set aside in our CIP in our asset protection fund. Um, as well, so um, that's part. Of, that's part of the challenge with redevelopment is you find a development partner that's willing to work with you because you already have a pretty significant chunk of change that you need to take care of, regardless of what happens. Um, so their agreement on the twenty-five percent cap is really significant. Um, and then again, we always. We, we continue to um, set aside in our CIP fund for that for that asset protection. 
not a rainy day fund per se, but but a kitty bar the door fund, mm -hmm. if you will. Perfect. And I think the the other thing, and I know I brought it up the last time um, we presented, is the soil conditions up there because we've already had significant issues up there, and I know the developers promised me that that's all taken care of, um, and you're gonna. Do whatever it takes, I guess. Um, I'm sure you're not gonna want to spend this investment and and have that happen again. So I think that was a risk. Um, but other than that, uh, my other question might be for the, the developer in regards to the the mall right now. Um, there's probably more vacant spots in the mall um, than I've seen in a really long time, or maybe even ever. Do you think that that is more aligned with COVID or or a trend of brick and mortar? Hi, my name is Scott Nelson, um, development with Mace Ridge, uh, same address in, in Phoenix, 11411 North Tatum. Um, you know, our belief is that there's going to be a flight to quality in regional shopping centers, that the A's will get better and the C's will probably need to be reimagined and re-envisioned. Mm -hmm. And the goal for us is to really get Flatiron Crossing out ahead of that, right? And, and we're seeing this across our portfolio and not every single asset, not every single market can support what we're talking about doing here. Um, but the idea of introducing mixed use, adding density to the campus, um, the continual reinvestment is so critical to the retailers, to our department store partners, to show that there is a desire to reinvest, a desire to keep these things viable, sustainable, growing ultimately. Um, interestingly enough, you know, across our portfolio, we are seeing sales volumes that exceed 2019 numbers, right? We don't know how much of that is kind of pent up shopping demand, how much of that is based on, you know, certain disposable income, maybe that doesn't exist in perpetuity going forward. We do know also that while there are a lot of retailers closing, there are a lot of new retailers coming to market, right? And for the longest time when things were good, retailers didn't have to bring their A game all the time. And so we always say this, I mean, consumers vote with their wallet, right? So when a retailer fails, doesn't necessarily mean bricks and mortar fails. It means potentially that that concept or that brand or that retailer didn't represent what the consumer wanted. So we as Maestrich believe wholeheartedly that bricks and mortar is here to stay. Is it going to change? Is it going to be evolved? Absolutely. We're trying to get out ahead of that. We're trying to be more experiential. We're trying to be more things to more people, not just a shopping destination, but a place where the community wants to gather, shop, play, dine. I know it all's very cliche, but it's it's very accurate and apropos for what we believe these campuses need to become. We use the word town center a lot, and I think that was thrown around a lot over the last two decades as regional shopping centers were developed or thought about to be redeveloped. And, but I think it's I think it's paramount to the success of, I'll call them kind of reach, regional destinations versus just regional shopping centers. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, um, and I, I really think that this is a great opportunity for Broomfield. I appreciate you guys coming to Broomfield and, and um, redeveloping and rethinking that area. I agree with you, there's a lot of livability that we can add into Broomfield, and this is a big project for that. So thank you. That's all I have there. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Shad. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So uh, just to um, look at that uh, a little bit more in terms of the retail spaces that are there uh, in Flyer and Crossing Mall, um, you know, at, at points we have heard uh, from our public that there's uh, widespread vacancy in and around uh, Flyer and Crossing Mall. And I'm curious with this redevelopment, how do you anticipate those uh, those former built spaces to become um, you know thriving retail spaces in addition to these new spaces that are going to be created? So uh, you know, for us, we we kind of talked about this in house, right? You can either kind of add a square foot of retail, and it's going to generate X amount of sales, and thus 
you know, X amount of sales tax or rent, or we can take the square footage we have and continue to grow it, make it better, make it more productive. Um, I'll, I'll be very honest with you. Flatiron Crossing as a mall is probably oversized in terms of where we think regional retail is going. So not only do we see ourselves backfilling existing vacancy with new and exciting experiential concepts or retail concepts in general, but possibly bringing mixed use interior to the mall and interior to the four walls of the mall today, right? So not dissimilar to what we're thinking about in the former Nordstrom box, right? There aren't, when, when this mall was built, there was probably seven or eight traditional department stores that were vying for those spaces. Today, there's maybe three. Um, so we're seeing a lot of kind of unique repositions, repositionings and repurposing of these anchor stores or former anchor stores. So one of our concepts that we believe has a lot of merit is to convert that to a class A office space and, and hopefully in months to come we'll be bringing forward a, a plan and, and a program for what we think that can be. That's extremely exciting and, and quite honestly we're looking at that across several of our our anchor boxes across our portfolio um but but to answer your question directly council member you know the goal for us is to be able to tell a story of growth investment evolution because right now we can't tell that story and so that's what's so critical about this moment that we're at today is the ability to show not only retailers end users multifamily developers, hotels, office users, that this is a highly amenitized place that you either want to live or work or shop or be part of the overall campus. And so that's really, I don't think there's a secret sauce or a perfect formula. And I think it was Jeff that mentioned this, you know, you, you go to different projects, whether it's Cherry Creek and Cherry Creek North or just to a town center or a downtown and the integration of, of a mix of uses is kind of critical to kind of the social being. Um, and so that's what we're going to play upon. Um, and that's what we want to continue to kind of pursue. Great. Thank you. Uh, and uh, this may be a question for staff. So early on, uh, Mr. Romine, you had mentioned in your presentation that 20% of the sales and use taxes uh, for Broomfield are coming from the flat and crossing mall. Um, with this redevelopment, do we anticipate that this 20% will increase or decrease over say, the next 15 years? Uh, uh, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, Council Members, Council Member Shaft, um, that's a great question. We have anticipated that there'll be some sales growth that will continue. Um, we've, we've anticipated that growth will be roughly 2% on an annualized basis, with a couple of jumps coming in when some of the redevelopment markers are hit. Uh, because that brings new energy and new excitement and, and that new um, generalized activity. So that's how we forecasted it going forward. If you recall, um, that's a really conservative number because right now the Federal Reserve Bank's targeted inflation rate is roughly two to two and a half percent. So we're basically saying our retail sales activity on that will grow slightly, uh, but we'll stay somewhat the same. And again, that was to take a conservative approach. Brenda. Uh, as I already mentioned, that that's tuning the way we do our budgets and the way we think about all of it. The real growth will come on a property tax side, both the real and the business personal property tax. Those two are what will be coming from the Class A office uh, that Scott just talked about. And so we see that as an opportunity. We also see an opportunity around a lodging uh, facility that they think will be likely coming in, uh, maybe even in first phase, but definitely in the second phase. And what we see there. It is probably a higher end lodging uh, facility and more similar to what we saw when um, the Omni first opened up. In that sense of a highly amenitized, obviously there will not be a golf course related to this, this lodge. Um, that would make sense. But that kind of amenitized place to stay, to be able to both for the, the corporate uh, traveler who's coming to that uh, meet with people in the Class A office space, but also for those who are looking for that destination. As many of you may know, some of the highest points of tourism in the front range are the three major malls, which is Cherry Creek, uh, Park Meadows, and Flatirons. That is where an awful lot of tourism is occurring as one of the points of stop for them. And that's people coming from Wyoming, Nebraska, others. And so that's where we see the revenue runs and gains will be coming primarily through the property tax side. 
Excellent. Thank you so much. That's all I have. Thank you. Council Member Lynn. Uh, yes, uh, thank you to the applicant for providing the view corridor um, sight lines in the um, memo. Uh, that was um, in particular um, appropriate for the question from the Ward 3 Lacamora resident who was concerned about if the view would be blocked from Lacamora. Um, of course, the US 36 sub area plan uh, already allows. Um, the uh, 10 story commercial and residential there. Um, we're just doing a slight increase um, for beyond that. Um, does the applicant anticipate that we will that the buildings will hit 135 feet? Um, is this a well in case we need it, or is it too early to tell? Um, I think it's a combination of the two. I mean, you know, at 150 or so acres, you know, we see this as, you know, an evolution over decades, right? So kind of what we're talking about here initially is, is really starting to create that momentum and critical mass of mixed use activity that we hope facilitates more over time, right? Um, so really the height quotient is one of product type. Um, in all honesty, I don't see any residential buildings in the in kind of our current environment, both you know, rental rate and cost structure going to you know those heights, right? Because when you go to 135 feet, you're going to steel and concrete versus a parking structure with kind of a wrap wood podium product. On the office front, just like you see all throughout interlocking, absolutely you can see that happening. Um, so it's and then the hotel, you know, maybe it's under 35 feet, maybe it's something less, but that too, as a product type or as a use, could certainly take advantage of the 135. Um, so it's it's a little bit mixed, uh, council member, um, but but we would certainly like to um, encourage that. Um, because again, we think it drives kind of the diversification of the campus as well as uh, the uses across the campus. Okay, thank you. And those, like I said, those were helpful in the packet to see those sight lines. Thank you. Um, the um, okay. So I actually I actually had the opportunity when I was visiting my son last week to go see Tyson's Corner Center. Which is, of course, an older development that you had actually you had mentioned it in your previous presentation. So I thought, well, I'm here. Um, I might as well look at it. Um, the plaza size is very small at Tyson's Corner Center from what I expect to see at Flatiron. Is that um, a, a good comparison of what? <clears throat> I don't recall off the top of my head what Tyson's Plaza is, but my recollection, and we certainly can, can follow up, the plaza that we're contemplating at Flatiron is larger, if my recollection serves me correctly on acreage, than the one we have at Tyson's. Um, Tyson's was a little bit more constrained in terms of existing conditions. Um, there was a Lord and Taylor department store and an existing parking garage that basically kind of limited how wide it could be. And then quite honestly, um, it was a balance of what um, the city and the county, Fairfax County wanted as it related to, there's a big rail line that comes down there and there's, we connected the plaza to said rail stop. So I think it's, a, it's, it's not a perfect comparison in terms of typology of development, but to answer your question directly, the plaza at Flatiron will be bigger than the plaza there. Okay. Um, and the plaza at Tyson's Corner Center has AstroTurf. Uh, oh my goodness. Okay, so uh, I noticed I noticed in the memo that it said that you were um, going to use um, native plants and low water maintenance. So that's what you anticipate doing? Yeah, the reason why the, the plaza has um, turf at Tyson's Corner is because it sits up on a podium and there's actually parking underneath it. Okay. Uh, and, 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 and what's interesting is back to the soils question. 
we have to be very methodical, strategic, and engineered in terms of how we introduce water to the overall site because it's the water infusion into the soil or intrusion into the soil that creates the expansive soil, which creates the problem. So it is a ecosystem of drainage and plantings and water introduction that we are going to have to dial in formulaically to make sure that we aren't introducing more risk than we want to take on. So I would only say it. so, but but generally what you see out there today, which I to, what's interesting is I think Flatiron Crossing from a landscaping standpoint and is one of the nicest regional shopping centers I've ever seen of that nature. Um, and I think we can only better that. Okay. Um, the customer traffic for any, if it, there's, there's not comparison density to Broomfield, but the customer traffic was amazing. At Tyson's Corner Center at Wednesday at noon, um, it was like, and every shop, uh, there were no empty shops in this huge center. Yeah, and it's roughly two point. It's a, it's a super regional yeah. juggernaut, and it, it speaks to, you know, density is a cure for a lot of things. I mean, it, not everybody agrees with density, um, but but something that supports Tyson's Corner is, I mean, it is it is massive amounts of density and height and office space and commercial and hospitality and residential, and and that helps create the environment that you witnessed and experienced. And do we get a Tesla store in Flatiron? <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of you know folks like Tesla, like Lucid, um, that are coming along. That what's interesting is without getting into Tesla's business, Tesla continues to wait or decide whether or not they want to be in malls or they want to be in a freestanding service location where they can service the cars and sell the cars, right? Because they built their brands. They needed malls for their brand recognition. Now you see a lot of their competition starting to come in and do similar things to what they did in terms of taking position in malls. So it's it's an interesting dynamic. So it's interesting you brought that up. Um, that gets us in, I guess, my sustainability questions. The um, Obviously, the site development plans will specify the sustainability um, elements a little further. Um, there, um, I appreciate the notes in the packet about the existing solar arrays. Um, the, the what I what I did notice at Tyson's Corner Center was there was no recycling at the food court or in the plaza. That seems simple to me. I mean, every other place in Virginia in that area is into recycling, composting, and there was none. That so, surprised me, but yeah, I don't. So, so I'm sure that I mean it wasn't mentioned in your sustainability program directly in our memo, but I I just wanted some assurance that that would be part of your um, program to include recycling, composting. You have 100 assurance. I mean, um, that is a huge kind of component, and and that's why I'm a little bit surprised. I'm actually as soon as I leave here, I'm but but it's kind of in our DNA, the kind of the environmental sustainability aspect of it, our SEG. Um, and and we know it's in, in, incredibly important to this community and, and to a lot of communities we do business in. So I, I give you 100% assurance that that will be incorporated. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Any other council member questions? All right, there being no further questions, the public hearing is closed. Next is Council's consideration of proposed resolution number 2021-160. Will the clerk please read proposed resolution number 2021-160 by title. Resolution number 2021-160, authorizing and approving the Flatiron Crossing Plan Unit Development Plan Amendment number one, for the Flatiron Crossing redevelopment. Is there a motion? Councilmember Lindstedt. Thank you, Mayor. I move that resolution number 2021-160 be adopted. Is there a second, Councilmember Brew? Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Councilmember Lindstedt. 
Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I'll be brief just because we have a, a really long agenda tonight. Um, but I, I didn't want to let the opportunity go by just to acknowledge how important this um, this, this deal is for our community. You know, the, the jobs, the, the financial, the long-term financial health of our community, um, all all come down to this mall. So I, I I'm really excited. I'm really excited for the, the added density and the the, the added economic traffic we're going to have there and. You know, I know this isn't everything everybody wants in this deal. I would have loved the, the 60% AMI on the housing, but it is what it is. And I'm I'm just very excited to see this moving forward. So I just wanted to take a minute and, and thank staff and thank the research group for all their work on this. Um, that's all I have, Mayor. Um, thanks so much. All right, thank you. Any other discussion? How's the membership? Uh, thank you, Mayor. So, uh, you know, I agree. I think that, you know, this is one of those uh, projects for Broomfield that uh, has one of my uh, uh, fellow council member says the economic engine of Broomfield providing 20% of sales and use taxes for Broomfield means that other uh, uh, revenue streams uh, can remain uh, lower uh, than, than probably they would without it. So uh, that for uh, that for this uh, redevelopment is very important is to continue that economic engine for Broomfield. Um, I think that um, you know with this deal. Uh, you know, I felt the pressure that we had to get it right, that we had to get all these elements in there to ensure that that sustainability continues uh, for the long-term future of this project. And I think that, you know, there, there are some great things about this project and things that I want to see. And there are some things that I wish were uh, improved, uh, but I think that we got uh, a good mix of um, what's in there and what the final reinvestment of this project will be. And I believe that, you know, the future uh, sustainability of this project and the economic engine will continue for Brookfield. So thank you to staff and thank you to the applicants who bring this forward. And, uh, great, uh, it's a great opportunity to be a partner in this. That's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. Any other council member discussion? All right, will the clerk please call the roll? Jusersky? Yes. Lim? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Lindstedt? Yes. Schaff? Yes. Tessier? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Cohen? Yes. Groom? Yes. Finkel? Yes. That passes unanimously. Next is Council's consideration of proposed resolution number 2021-170. Will the clerk please read proposed resolution number 2021-170 by title. Resolution number 2021-170 authorizing a redevelopment agreement of a portion of the Flatiron Crossing Mall by and between the City and County of Broomfield and Flatiron Property Holding LLC. Thank you. Is there a motion? Councilmember Lindstedt? Thank you, Mayor. I move that resolution number 2021-170 be adopted. Thank you. Is there a second, Councilmember Broom? Second. <clears throat> Will the uh, clerk please call on oh, the very discussion? And we're down with that. Okay. Um, will the clerk please call the roll? <laughs> Lynn? Yes. Lindstedt? Yes. Schaff? Yes. Tessier? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Cohen? Yes. Broom? Yes. Finkel? Yes. Yes. That passes unanimously to congratulations. Thank you all so much. Our next item under council business this evening is the public hearing and council's consideration on second and final reading of proposed ordinance number 2162, adopting customer service standards for Comcast cable franchise grantees. I'll now declare the public hearing open. We'll follow the city standard public hearing procedures as previously outlined. Council has a copy of the agenda memorandum, which I'll ask our staff to summarize. Thank you, Mayor Katiri Aveda. Our director of IT is going to walk through a, a very brief overview given that it is second reading of the ordinance. Ms. Aveda. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and members of Council. I'm Katiri Aveda, IT director. This is the second reading of proposed ordinance 2162, adopting Comcast customer service standards. Um, there's no new information to present um, from the first reading held on September 14th, 2021. Um, Mr. Ken Fellman of Kissinger and Fellman and Mr. Andy Davis, um, Director of Government Affairs for, for Comcast, are available 
to assist in answering any questions that you may have. Uh, so I'll turn it over to council for questions. Thank you, Ms. Beta. We'll now proceed with public comment. Does any member of the public have comments on this agenda item? I'm not seeing any online. Questions from city council are next. Members should limit themselves to questions during this portion. The time to introduce amendments and state positions for or against is later. Are there any questions from council? There being no questions, the public hearing is closed. Next is council's consideration of proposed ordinance number 2162. Will the clerk please read proposed ordinance number 2162 by title? Ordinance number 2162, adopting customer service standards, standards for cable franchise grantees, pursuant to second reading, Comcast customer service standards, subsection 5-14-030D of the Broomville Municipal Code. Is there a motion? Council Member Groom? I move mean, that ordinance number 2162 be adopted on second reading, second and final reading and ordered to publish. By title. By, I'll say by title. I can say it. <laughs> I, I know. Yes, that's, that's intentional. Thank you. If there were any amendments, we would publish in full. Since there was no changes, we'll publish by title. All right. Is there a second? That's my second. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Well, the clerk, please call the roll. Lindstedt? Yes. Shaft? Yes. Tessier? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Cohen? Yes. Broom? Yes. Hinkle? Yes. Kuzerski? Mm -hmm. Yes. Lim? Yes. That passes unanimously. Thank you all for being with us this evening. Next is the public hearing and council's consideration of one proposed resolution and one ordinance on second and final reading amended room bill board and commission. I'll now declare the public hearing open. We'll follow the city's standard public hearing procedures as previously outlined. Council has a copy of the agenda memorandum, which I'll ask our staff to summarize. Thank you, Mayor. Erica Delaney Lou, our city county clerk. Um, again, this is the second and final reading. Ms. Delaney Lou. Yes, good evening. Mayor Castriata, Mayor Pro Tem Jazerski, and council members. As Ms. Hoffman noted, we are here on second reading on an item with agenda, agenda item 11A which is the public hearing for ordinance 2163 um, concerning proposed restructuring. We have no new information for you tonight on the ordinance, which was passed on first reading on September 14th. And with regard to resolution 2021-177, which has not been before council before, this, uh, the purpose of this resolution is to make the youth advisory positions on the advice ACES, advisory <laughs> committee for sustainable environmental sustainability, it would make those youth positions two years to be consistent with all the other youth positions on our boards and commissions. So that's all I have for you tonight, but I am here for questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Delaney Lou. We'll now proceed with public comments. If anyone has uh, comments on this item, please step up to the podium. Seeing none, questions from city council are next. Members should limit themselves to questions and the time to introduce amendments is later. Are there any questions from council? There being no questions, the public hearing is closed. Next is council's consideration of proposed ordinance number 2163 on second and final reading. Will the clerk please read proposed ordinance number 2163 by title. Ordinance number 2163, amending certain chapters and sections of the Broomfield Municipal Code relating to youth membership on cultural council and reducing the number of Broomfield boards and commissions generally. Thank you. Is there a motion, Council Member Tessia? Thank you. Um, I move that ordinance number 2163 be adopted on second and final reading in order to publish my title. Thank you. Is there a second, Council Member Shaw? Second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Oh, wait, I'm doing a roll call. Will the clerk please call the roll? Just to be safe, Council Member Live and Anderson? Oh, oh my apologies. I saw, I, my apologies. I got, I got off my thing. Shaft? Yes. Tessier? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Cohen? Yes. Broom? Yes. Pinkle? Yes. Jazerski? Yes. Lynn? Yes. 
Let's set. Yes. Thank you. That passes unanimously. Next is Council's consideration of proposed resolution number 2021-177. Will the clerk please read proposed resolution number 2021-177 by title. Resolution number 2021-177, setting youth member terms on the Advisory Committee on Environmental Sustainability to two years. Is there a motion? Council Member Groom? I move that resident ordinance number 2163 be adopted on second and final reading and order published by title. Thank you. Oh. Right? No, nope, that was the wrong one. Um, I move that resolution number 2021-177 be adopted. Thank you. Is there a second? Council Member Tessier. Thank you. Second. Is there any discussion? Will the clerk please call the roll? Tessier? Yeah. Anderson? Yes. Cohen? Yes. Groom? Yes. Kinkle? Yes. Chizersky? Yes. Lim? Yes. Lindstedt? Yes. Shep? Yes. Thank you. That passes unanimously as well. Thank you very much, Ms. Delaney. The final item under council business this evening is council's consideration on the first reading of proposed ordinance number 2165, amending the Broomfield Municipal Code to modify city council's compensation. Council has a copy of the agenda memorandum, which I'll ask our staff to summarize. Appreciate that. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Nikki Macklin, our Director of Human Resources, is going to walk us through this item. Nancy Rogers, City County Attorney, is also um, going to um, assist in the presentation. And this is a conversation that's been occurring since 2019. And Ms. Macklin is going to walk us through the history and then lead us up to where we are today. Ms. Macklin. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and Council. As Ms. Hoffman said, this, this conversation has been Ongoing since 2019, in, in March of this year, a memo was drafted by staff for council's review to um, address current council's compensation. In that, we looked at comparable cities to evaluate Broomfield's compensation for council, as well as looking at um, county commissioners' pay. Council's compensation has not been modified or reviewed since 2016. Currently, compensation for council is $800 a month for council, $900 a month for mayor pro tem, plus $100 for a month added on top of that for council pay. And then um, the memo um, accidentally states $1,200 per month for mayor, but that's actually $1,100. So staff conducted research for other municipalities, which you can see on the next slide and review the statute governing county commissioner compensation. You can see a summary of that chart here. The proposed ordinance number 2165 sets compensation for council members at 1400 per month, which you can see on the next slide. 1800 a month for mayor pro tem, 400 a month added to the council member pay, and then 2000 a month for mayor pay. The new compensation amount would apply to those elected at the November 2021 election, and those individuals do be elected chosen in the future. Additional proposed, additionally, proposed ordinance 2165 would require council to review the comp for the mayor and the council members every two years starting in 2022. So in the interest of time, I will stop there unless you have anything else to add, Mrs. Hoffman. I do. The only other, the only other piece is uh, subsequent to 2019 when the conversations began, um, Council had instructed staff to include in the citizen survey um, that was completed uh, earlier this year, two specific questions with regards to compensation. Um, it was that direction from the citizen feedback that then directed Ms. Macklin in order to do the research on comparables. Um, it was a 75% strongly favored Increasing council compensation, thus um, the memo, and why we're here tonight. That concludes staff's presentation, Mayor. Thank you, Ms. Hoffman. We'll now proceed with public comment. Does any member of the public have comments on this agenda item? We'll start with in person comment. If there's anyone who would like to be heard, please come to the podium and state your name and neighborhood for the record, and please limit your comments to three minutes. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. When I began my career, I worked as an assistant to a city manager in a Minneapolis suburb, and my then husband had the same position 
in the neighboring community. We both had council meetings every Monday night and we would bet which one of us would arrive home first. They generally lasted until midnight to one in the morning. We didn't keep track of who won the bets. What we learned was that representative government takes time. The council devotes a lot of time to their public service work. That work is usually done as a labor of love for the community. The 2021 Broomfield Community Survey showed support for a council salary increase when provided the figures over the past 27 years. If the question was asked with the context that the council was paid 7% more than the highest comparable city on a per capita basis, the question may have been answered differently. The survey also showed the overall performance of the city council was one of the five items ranked lowest out of the 48 items that were surveyed compared to national benchmarks. If grades were assigned, that would be a grade of D or F. That makes a raise of 75% for the council members, 100% for the mayor pro tem, and 82% for the mayor, inappropriate in my opinion. How can such a raise be justified given the low ranking of the council's performance and at this time? The council is rushing to take action on this personal agenda before the election. A modest increase might be justified if the community survey didn't rank the council performance as subpar. Given that assessment, the size of the increase is way out of line, the timing is wrong, and the increase isn't deserved. Thank you for your consideration. Oh, did I mention this is Jan Billsparrow again from Red Lake? Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Mayor Pro Tem and City Council members. My name is Chris Hammerschmidt. I live in the Little Run subdivision. Um, I'm a federal worker. I understand public service. I get paid a lot lower uh, than any position you know, that I would have on the outside. And I think considering that people are coming out of the pandemic right now, inflation is going up. Um, we just heard from Hoffman that the budget is really tight right now. You just expended a lot of money um, in terms of the water and um, now the Flatirons Crossing Mall. I would just ask you to just table this for a little bit till we understand what the budget numbers are. Um, maybe next year would be a better time to review this. And if you do decide to go ahead with this, I would ask you to just decrease it. Um, that's almost twice as much as what you're making now. And the citizens, you know, they deserve a break too. So I would just have you reconsider it. I know it's not a lot more money to the budget, but, you know, taxpayers, they're having a hard time now too. So I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else step up to the podium? Again, Nick Cleveland in Broadlands. This really is a remarkable proposal. Mailboxes are still receiving checks from the federal government, as Ms. Hoffman pointed out several weeks ago, that come from the debt being added to the United States and the United States taxpayer. And yet, this proposal will take more of that money that's already coming from the federal government to pay for this. There's really only one word that I can use to, to sum it up, and that is that is hubris. Uh, to do this several weeks before an election, I, it, it strikes me as, as very hubris. Let's take some metrics. Ms. Billsboro did a wonderful job of doing that. Let's just take some general metrics. Uh, how, do, how does the employee uh, work with their colleagues? Well, we had a council member that had actually nearly driven off a county corner uh, this year. Um, so that is a metric that is not 
necessarily meeting uh, standards. How does the employee deal with customers or in your cases, constituents? Uh, I have noticed and I would assess, not with an HR degree, however, I would assess as a constituent that if you are a member of the same party of many of these folks on council or of the same groups, then that customer service is fantastic. If it's not, I would put it at subpar or perhaps even inappropriate. So I think that there's some tangible metrics that need to be met here, but let's let's be conciliatory. Okay, let's let's try and find some common ground. Um, I would say triple your salary if you stop using the taxpayer bills to pursue your own political agendas. Pay your own legal bills. Pay your own fees uh, for political purposes. I was actually just perusing uh, Mayor Castriota's financial report. Nice haul, by the way. Um, and a lot of that comes from public servants. And so we get this merry-go-round of taxpayer dollars going to fund other political campaigns. Uh, just consider this. And you're talking about 70,000 people in Broomfield who are still getting checks to, re to recover from the pandemic and the responses. And you're asking for a 65 to 75% raise. There's really only one word for that. I think we can all agree. It's hubris. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Mayor Kensel. Um, thanks for letting me be here. Neil Allaire. I live in Brookfield Heights, first filing. And um, Council Pay, when I first realized how much you all are paid, and this is several years ago, I was surprised. And I thought, great, people volunteer to do this, labor of love. And then I started thinking over a few years, how many people should be on council or could be on council would be great and can't afford it. Um, if you pass this, you'll get a whole 16,800 a year. It's not much. Where you're at now, it's what less than 10,000 a year. So a couple where each of them earns 50,000 a year, that's that's 100,000 a year, that's our average household income. Maybe one of them running for council would be taking a $40,000 pay cut to be on council. Even with the raise, it'd be 30,000 about. So the structure here is that if you can afford it to do a labor of love, great. If you can't, your voice isn't heard on city council. Um, and I know some of you have struggled. I know council members in the past have gone through that, but it's not a good way to run a professional organization in the city and county, which goes to all the different, you heard all the titles that you have, you have the boards and commissions, all that. You guys work a lot. Um, In fact, if you figured 30 hours a week, you'd be earning about half minimum wage um, at the current rate. Commit, you're, you're being compared with city council pay in the area. County commissioners earn 70, 100,000 more um, for what you do, plus the city. Great. So going up to what I say, 17,000 seems a pretty good bargain. And I think it should be tripled for what you're doing now. Thank you. Okay. My condition was keep doing it. You're doing great. You really are. The, the city gets 95% ratings and how much people like it. This is a great city. It's a wonderful city. And um, this campaign and actually before makes people talk about how terrible things are. They are not. Walk around Broomfield. It is a great place. So thanks for keeping us on track and moving into the future. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sandy Anderson. I've been COVID tested. I only have sinus infection. So sorry for this voice. <laughs> And I live in the Bravos. So if I miss the 
all the titles. I apologize. We have so much voice here, there, here, we have a couple members, and there. I just want to take a couple of minutes and say that I know and I see how much all the council members, and I'm talking about all the council members, invest in our city and do the work of the county. You know, I see the formal meetings, I see the discovery, I see the preparation, I see what you do with the non for profit where you invest also your personal time, and it is phenomenal. I am proud of all of you. And I want you to be able to receive the compensation for the investment of your time and talents. If you look at the compensation, I am so sorry here. Um, if you look at the compensation that aligns with the city um, council members, support of our citizens, as well as the city and council, um, both at the old rate and looking over the years with the annual increases and inflation that we've had, and also to open these roles to others so that they could be in service to our city, but not suffer financially because of it. It's really another step to the values of equality and inclusion to this great city, and you guys have done a wonderful job. And thank you. I'll give you back a minute, 30 seconds. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Uh, hello, David Hass, uh, Richard Heights. Um, my comment on the salary increase echoes some of the other comments that were made by uh, previous citizens that have come up here. For the last 18 months, I've been bombarded every day and watched the news of how much people are hurting, businesses that are being wiped out, people that are laid off. And while they are getting some help from the government, I think the fact that people have gone through this and there are lives of people that have been ruined because of this pandemic, that have lost businesses, lost their entire life savings, trying to keep businesses going and paying their employees and just wipe themselves out. I just think the timing of this kind of salary increase is, is not right. Maybe at another time, but I don't think right now is the right time to be doing this. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, I don't see any online. So questions from city council are next. Members should lend themselves to questions during this portion. The time to introduce amendments or state positions for or against this item is later. Are there any questions from council? Council member Shaft. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So, um, the, you know, this, this discussion has been a long time coming, but uh, with the uh, pandemic, it was definitely delayed. I mean, I remember uh, with the formal council that this came up at the end of that council term um, and with the pandemic, uh, it was uh, very much delayed. Um, given now that this is happening as candidates have, have declared, filed, or on the ballot, um, and myself included as a candidate uh, in the upcoming election, um, how does that uh, jive with our ethics policy or code of ethics uh, that we have for our us as elected officials? Not for, not for shop to, to vote on it, you mean? Correct. Thank you. So this would this would be a situation where recusal or abstaining from the vote might be appropriate. That's a determination to be made by an individual council member on the on the guidelines and what's in the code um, to include Robert's rules of order. And I wrote down some notes, um, council member chap. Um, it's been my advice to this council that if a council member believes that they need to recuse or abstain from a vote based on a personal or financial interest, they should. That's on the shoulders of the elected official to make that determination. It is not on this council to force anybody to vote when they believe there's a basis to not vote. Um, on that same note, um, recusal or abstention from a vote, as my predecessor would say, should not be used as a tool to avoid voting. Um, on hard topics. And I know that was advice that he had previously made. Um, this situation doesn't mandate recusal. It's not like if you own land and 
council is voting on that land. There is a conflict of interest provision that says you shall not vote. This falls more under the appearance of impropriety section, which is defined to include a situation where a reasonably prudent person would look at the situation and feel like you're using your public office for personal gain. Um, this is an interesting situation because charter puts the requirement on voting for council changes in compensation on council. You're the only body that can make a change to council compensation. Um, additionally, charter requires that members vote on items before it unless there's a personal, personal or financial interest. So that gets us back to the appearance of impropriety. Um, there is a financial benefit. Those of you that are running for a re-election that are sitting on the dais right now could potentially benefit soon from this increase. That's a contingent benefit. It's not automatic and it does not exist today. Um, so the ethics rule usually talk about current benefit, not possible benefits, but it can be a consideration. Um, Again, my advice is that it's not a mandatory recusal, um, but it's discretionary for each individual council member to make a determination if they feel strongly about the private gain that could happen from this vote. Great, thank you. So, uh, you know, recusal by process in the past has been we have left the room when the guidance is produced. Uh, I did not do that tonight. Uh, so what, what are my options now? Uh, you talked about abstaining and recusal. Um, you know, what does that look like at this point? In the in Broomfield's Code of Ethics, the mandated recusal when you have a direct conflict is the situation where you have to leave the room and you're told not to be involved in the discussions. This situation is more in line with Robert's Rules of Order, where you abstain from the vote and you abstain from the discussion and the debate on the matter. Okay. Um, but um, it's my advice that you could remain in the room and you could, as other council members have in the situation, leave as well. Sure, I wanted to bring a little bit more light to that survey question that was posed to the residents, because I, I do believe one of the residents talked about it, and Ms. Hoffman, you also brought it up, and I do think that there was um, definitely some leading information associated with that, but I was hoping that we could outline that specific question um, for the record. And the table basically had indicated, does anybody have the table with them? Like what years um, was updated and how much? And then can you read the question? Because I do think it was um, to the resident's point that, that spoke earlier, very um, clear that the increase would be extremely minor to the sum of maybe 200. And we're we're increasing it substantially. So I just want for the record to that to be read. Council member room, give me just one moment. Abby's chairman in the break. Was that in the, in the memo? The county is it on page? On page 21 of the community survey memo that we got. Councilmember, do you want me to read the question? Sure. Can you also outline what's in the table? Sure. Um, so it's Broomfield is coming up on its 20, 20 year anniversary. The state of Colorado voted to incorporate Broomfield as a city and county in 20, 2001 as a council manager, nonpartisan governance structure in which an elected city council serves as a, the city's primary legislative body and appoints a chief executive officer called the city manager to oversee day-to-day -day municipal operations, draft a budget, and implement and enforce council's policies and legislative initiatives. 
An alternative structure is having county commissioners through a charter change, which may be a full-time paid position representing each ward, similar to Jefferson County, Adams County, et cetera. Staff reports directly to the county commissioners in this model. Salary would be set through a potential ordinance change. How likely would you be to support a change to the city, to the county commissioner, would support a change to a county commissioner structure? Strongly supportive, somewhat supportive, somewhat opposed, uh, strongly opposed. So um, I was referring to the pay, not necessarily the county commissioner. Uh, let's see. So maybe the chart says 20 in, in 20, 2016. Um, so prior to 1995, the mayor, it was at 400. In 1995, went to 500. In 2001, it went to 800. In 2016, it went to 1100. Uh, the mayor pro tem prior to 1995 was 200. 1995, 300. 2001, 600. Uh, 2016, 900. Council members prior to 1995, 200. 1995, 300. Um, doubled in 2001 to 600. And then 800 in 2016. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, what is your question? That was my question. I wanted her to read it. I wanted it for the record. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? No. All right. Councilmember Anderson. Uh, thank you. And those those numbers were actually um, leading right into the question that I had as I was looking back at the ordinance and those the. I was just looking at the council members with the mayor and mayor Patrick were similar, where you're starting off at 200, then to 300, then to 600, into a gap of 16 years before it increased again. Mm -hmm. And I am very curious about, um, you know, you're looking at 2001, the city council was making $600, and here we are in 2017, making, you know, like $800. And so just curious why there was, as I was, Maybe you can't say why, but you know, it was just never considered that entire period of time that to keep up with inflation or anything. That, so that's the, yeah. So that's not really a, 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 a that's not really for uh, staff to to answer. Um, there um, there were conversations over the last four years about an automatic um, increase that is attached to whether it be. Um, 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 when, when we do our merit adjustments, um, reviewing market adjustments so that it, it kept, kept pace um, or outside of staff. Um, the first conversation that I can remember having, Councilmember Anderson, was attached to the, um, the consumer price index, connecting it to the, to the CPI outside, outside of staff. But as far as why, why there's gaps and or um, the amounts, um, I, I can't I can't speak to that. No, that's that's fair. It's just that you know I just want to make sure we're pointing that out that there's a 16 year gap where there were no increases and and a, a great population growth as well um, in representation. So I, that's my that was my question. Thank you. Um, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Seeing none. Next is council's consideration of proposed ordinance number two one six five on first reading. Will the clerk please read proposed ordinance number 2165 by title. Ordinance number 2165 amending chapter 2-02 city council compensation of the Broomfield Municipal Code. Thank you. Is there a motion, Mayor Pro Tem? I'll move the ordinance number 2165 Is there a second? Councilmember Chastier? Second. Is there any discussion? Councilmember Shaft. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So uh, just to go back to my uh, question that I asked, um, if if uh, I wanted to abstain from the vote, uh, would that happen during the roll call or do I need to announce that at this point? Council Member Shaft, there's no procedural requirement. You could do it at any time. You definitely need to do it during the vote. Great. All right. I, I intend to uh, abstain from uh, this vote, just to let my council colleagues know. All right. Council Member Room. Certainly, um, yeah, I 
I intend to um, turn down this proposal for this raise. One, I think the citizens were misled in regards to the citizen survey. It alludes to the fact that we're giving $100, $200, or $300 raises. It has nothing to do with the magnitude of raise that we would be giving um, this council. And I do want to say, um, spending so much time in the business world, uh, there's got to be a salary adjustment with the role adjustment. And we're increasing salary and we're decreasing our role. So just tonight, we took one thing off of our plate, which is the housing authority. Another thing that's in our strategic plan and we definitely want to do if, if the pre next council agrees is to take the housing authority off of our plate. We've also re reconstructed the planning and zoning. We split it into two. That benefits our developers, but it also benefits our agenda and our oversight as council because we don't see as many concept reviews that are coming. In addition, we just reduced the number of boards and commissions that we're on. So for me, um, I see our role being depleted, rightfully so, I, I'm in line with that, but I also see us giving ourselves a raise and a significant raise. And then on top of that, I think you all know that I've been extremely um, vocal regarding what we've done to the city and county employees, where we did not give them their full year of merit increase. And, um, you know, when they're looking at a 3% increase and we're looking at a 75% increase, I think that just doesn't look right altogether. And then we have the audacity to not retro them for their full year of merit increase. And they're the ones out there touching the public. They're the ones that got us through COVID. They're the ones that are um, busting their butts because we're understaffed and we can't hire. So um, for me, I think the audacity of us proposing a 75 and 100% pay increase for ourselves is ridiculous. Um, so I, I plan on turning this down and I'm not gonna recruit myself, uh, <laughs> even though I am running. So thank you very much. Thank you. Council Member Kelly. Just real quickly, I learned of this, this issue coming forward when I joined the council and immediately assumed that since I was a candidate, I would abstain. And the discussion just confirms that for me tonight, so I will abstain. Thank you. Mayor Potem. Thank you, um, Mayor. Um, so I, I'm going to support this tonight, and I'm going to give you a couple of reasons why. But when I first address the, the timing, I'll, I'll, I'll acknowledge at the time, this isn't the best. Um, but as Councilmember Shep uh, briefly mentioned, this was first discussed a um, little less than two years ago when uh, um, myself was reelected and some of the other new council members that are up here you know, were elected. And unfortunately, uh, COVID, COVID happened, and this issue was put on the back burner for about 18 months. Um, a lot of things that were quite, quite honestly more important uh, did pop up during that time period. And unfortunately, we haven't been able to get it back on the agenda, you know, until now. So not the best timing, but you know, it is what it is, and it's, it's before us now um, today. Um, I also want to clarify that this this was stated in the presentation, but just in case anyone didn't catch it, you know, it only applies to to new terms. So this means you know those um, candidates that are elected in this election or any elections you know, going forward. And for myself, you know, I will never benefit or likely never benefit from this proposed increase. You know, I'm not running for election this year, and I term limited in two years. So, unfortunately, or fortunately, I will never um, yeah, uh, benefit from this one way or the other. Um, I, I can't say that after six years of experience, you know, and being on city council, you know, I, I do support, the, as I said, the, the increased uh, proposal here. Um, I easily put in, you know, ten to twenty hours, you know, per week, and I could say that's on the on the low end of of, of many of my colleagues. Um, you know, it, it was mentioned uh, by um, Councilmember Groom that we are doing what we can to um, make this a position you know, a little less onerous, but it also, um, I guess, ignores the fact that over the past 20 years, this position has gotten increasingly complex um, with, with many, many, many new issues. Uh, one of them has to be one of them that have popped up over the years. So, you know, this was a, and as our population has increased as well. 
So, you know, this, uh, this position has grown, you know, exponentially complex over the years while the pay has increased, you know, as you heard, very slightly. You know, currently right now we're being paid you know, $800 per month. It's not per week, but that's, that's per month. And even at the numbers that's, that I told you that, you know, I would typically put in, you know, that comes at up to you know, between $10 or, or $20 an hour. Um, so some months is below minimum wage. Uh, the increase that we're talking about, you know, increases it to, to $1,400 um, for, for council members. So this is a $600 increase per month. And, you know, at, at $20 an hour or 20, you know, 20 hours a week, excuse me, you know, I could like that to come out to $1,750 an hour. Um, still fairly modest um, and less than most professional um, jobs that are out there today, particularly in, in, in Broomfield. So I do realize that this is a public service position and I, and I can say that I didn't take this position um, for the salary. Uh, that was never in my mind and I honestly didn't even know what the pay was or, or that it was paid when I, when I, when I first ran. Um, however, you know, I can say that, you know, some potential candidates are, are not as, uh, I guess, fortunate as I, as I am or as I was. And they, and they do need a reasonable stipend to, to make this position attainable. Um, you know, many, there are potential candidates out there that you know, can't afford to take off 20 hours per week to, to do this job. It's gonna be too much of an economic you know, hit to their, to their salary, to their household income. So, you know, I, I guess I hope that this increase, um, you know, does make the job a little more attainable for, for folks and enlarges the, the group of potential candidates out there that can, that can run for these positions. And I guess for me, that should be, that should, that should be our, you know, our ultimate goal, to really have the best possible candidates you know, running for city council and have the best possible folks sitting up here on the dais. Um, I can say that I've spoken with many of my neighbors on this issue, and most have been surprised by the, by the, by the pay that, 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 that I do receive. You know. um, most uh, assumed it was much higher, and none have expressed uh, any concern over the, the, the increase. So. Um, for these uh, reasons, you know, I, I do fully support the uh, proposal tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Lansdowne. Thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, when I first ran for this this seat, I, I did it full well in knowing that it would be eight hundred dollars a month um, for the amount of work it is, and that is, I, I, I came in knowing that, and I, I'm doing that work now, and I'm doing it because it's a labor of love, um, as uh, Ms. Billsborough said. Um, some weeks, um, I'm Broomfield's Dr. Cog member, and on those Dr. Cog member weeks, it could be 30, 40 hours. I mean, these, these weeks are a lot sometimes. Um, so, you know, I'm doing that as a labor of love. Um, and I just, I, I, I wanted to correct the record on a couple things here. Um, first, it's illegal for any member of this, this body to raise their pay in their term. So this vote, will affect whoever's sitting in this seat when my term ends. It will affect whoever's sitting in any of these seats when our current term ends. So this isn't, people are saying we're voting to raise our own pay. That's 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 factually inaccurate. So I just wanted to, to get that on the record um, and clarify that because it's 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 just it's not we're not allowed to do that. Um, second, um, I, I wanted to mention that I went back and looked at the community survey here, and um, a, a resident had said that uh, this council's performance was 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 bad um, overall in the survey. Um, this government body had a 66% approval rating in the survey. Um, that's two points higher than in 2018. That's about the same as 2015 and 2012. That's nine points higher than 2007. Um, so I. I, I think that's a pretty misleading way to interpret that survey data. Um, just to be to be frank, if we're, if we're gonna argue that surveys are misleading, I, I really, uh, I, I think that's, a, that's a, a much more misleading way to portray it. Um, so just, just to clarify, um, you know, th this job, and I'll, I'll tell you why I'm gonna support this tonight. And there's two reasons. Um, the first one, is that there's a reason you don't see very many people run for these jobs. There's a reason that the ballot usually only has two people on it. There's a reason for 20 years we had basically unopposed slates of retirees running for these roles. There's a reason I'm the only millennial who's ever served up here. 
And it's because it's very hard to have a full-time job and make this work financially if you have a mortgage, if you have student loans, if you're raising a family, it doesn't work. So if you want more people to run for office, more people of diverse backgrounds, you need to raise this salary to something. And you know, fourteen hundred dollars a month isn't a lot, but it would make a big difference um, for, for a lot of people thinking about running for office in the future. The second reason I think this is really important, and I think it's something a lot of folks in the audience would agree with me on. Is, is government accountability. Do you really want people up here who, who are putting in, you know, maybe five, 10 hours a week because they think that's commiserate with a salary overseeing staff? I think our staff is doing an incredible job, but tonight we saw developments in the hundreds of millions of dollars. We saw our $400 million budget and, you know, Broomfield's the only city and county, or it's a city and county, it's the only county in Colorado without some kind of full-time representation some type, type of full-time people holding government accountable and really di diving into to, to the issues. Um, so we're, we're kind of in a weird place where, um, you know, th this role is really important. It's really, really important to, to, to hold staff accountable and to make sure that the public, we are the public's way to, 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 to direct staff, um, you know, have what they, they want um, in these decisions. So. I think for, 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 for good government's sake and for the sake of having a, a diverse and uh, equitable city council in the future, we need, to, we need to change this. And I don't think $1,400 is an unreasonable amount of money for this, this work. I mean, these can be 10, 20, even 40 hours a week sometimes. Um, so that's why I'm supporting it tonight. Um, I know the, the timing isn't very bad and, and a lot of people want to make political hay out of it, but um, it's, this isn't going to affect me. So um, it's, it's, it's going to affect the future of Broomfield and, and it's the right thing to do. So um, that's all I have. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Member Council Member Tessier? Uh, I don't know if I can tell them. That, you know, I think um, Council Member Lindstedt and Mayor Pro Tem it really has said it best, you know, city council gets blamed for everything, no matter what. And I've been here for eight years, and I am definitely in favor of giving the next council who's going to represent us a little something extra. Because you know what? I use every penny that I get to, to, to help my family succeed. I wouldn't be able to do this. I had to actually... I was at one time not working and I couldn't afford to be on council. So I had to go get myself a full-time job and, and I love it. And it's, it takes, I'm working a hundred hours a week. So um, to have a little compensation around that, I think that's totally fair. And to reiterate one more time, this is not giving ourselves a raise. I'm happy, more than ecstatic, to support the future of Broomfield um, and to get some diversity and equity um, inclusion um, and get some other people up here that represent all of Broomfield, not just those who can afford to do this labor of love. Because I love Broomfield. I love it. And I wouldn't change a thing about what I've gone through. Um, but if I can change it for somebody else, you bet you. You bet you I am. So, um, I intend to fully support it, and I really do appreciate those who are abstaining tonight. I think that's that's the right thing to do. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Jesse. Councilmember Hankel. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thanks for everyone speaking tonight, and thank you for um, all the colleagues' comments tonight. They've been really powerful. Um, again, this is not a vote for ourselves. That is absolutely not true. Um, I often am in county commissioners meetings and the people really want their commissioners to be fighting for dollars for them. And, and the only way to do that and be with the big dogs with the other commissioners is to have that time spent. I just received an email, you know, about uh, you know, metro area county commissioners having a whole day dedicated talking about what affects our metro area counties. And we are a county and we we're very proud of that, and I think our citizens really deserve representation at the county level as well. Um, 
I have actually been discriminated against because I've had this job. I'm actually applying for full-time jobs. I've been asked twice if I would quit my city council member job because they think that I get paid full-time. And that is just like that, that constant, you know, thought that we're getting paid full time. So I've actually been discriminated against because I've held this job. And I don't want to hide this job. In fact, I've been very proud of this job. But I will tell you, um, that when I put it on my resume, it makes me nervous just because, um, you know, I don't know if I'm going to be discriminated against because of it, because of how much time I put in. And it is easily 30 to 40 hours a week. I also want to mention who we're excluding. Uh, Councilmember Lindstedt mentioned, you know, <laughs> there's a reason why you have the only millennial. And I've appreciated his viewpoint. He offers a lot of viewpoints on, on uh, transportation, um, you know, just the sort of that younger viewpoint. I've been talking with a younger uh, Black female uh, in Broomfield. And the second I told her how much we got paid, she laughed. And I find that disheartening because she's a single mom. And that wouldn't even cover her babysitting costs of her children. And so we need to have, um, if we're really serious about diversity, equity, access, and inclusion, we need to make sure um, that we have this compensation to include those people because we do have to think about who we're excluding. And we are excluding someone like her, and that's unfortunate. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Anderson. Oh, thank you. I do not have much to add to this because I was going to kind of echo Iron Mayor Patam and I was going to kind of echo Dr. Um, Lindstedt. I mean, these, these are the reasons. And so it just keeps, you know, just keep adding on to that. Um, and I, I want to share that this is a very difficult place to be. There is never going to be a good time to do this because we have, we started this discussion uh, quite a while ago when the pandemic hit and the, the, this discussion ended and the end. We could wait till the beginning of the, the next the next council's appointed. It looks like you're giving yourself, you know, wanting to give yourself a raise just after you got seated. And no matter when you do this, it's not going to be the right time. Um, so I've got that in the forefront of my mind, um, along with all these great reasons. And I just pulled up this uh, quickly while we were um, discussing earlier. And I was looking at, you know, the increase. It started off as $200, uh, $200 compensation, and then it was $399.95. And in 2001, it was double. That's all the time we know that. Could have to do with the city and county they formed with double the six hundred dollars at the time of the population of Broomfield was thirty eight thousand two hundred seventy two. Um, we're now at twenty you know twenty twenty one here. Our population is now seventy four thousand. That's more than double what it was back in two thousand one. So if we want to look at you know compensation for per capita then and now, it's this is right in line to go to fourteen hundred dollars. I. I, I, I would have rather seen this as a gradual increase from 2001 on up, but from 2001 to 2017, 16 years went by with no, no increase in compensation. Um, and so I really only signed up for this, for the $800. It is not about the compensation, the issues were, the issues were why I did this. But I, I, I hear the concerns of, I heard it back when we started discussing this in 2019 and still hear them today that this is, unless you're, a retired individual or have a spouse that has compensation or you've had a good career, that you limit certain people from running. And I, I truly believe that's one of the main reasons to um, increase the compensation as well as um, we really want representation and to be part of these boards and commissions and to, to be there when we're alongside county commissioners and, and do the best we can. And it includes preparation. There's a lot of reading that has to be done if you really want to give um, good public comment and I guess also by that um, funding. So there's uh, something else that was provided to me today, which um, I think was one of uh, just this has nothing to do with the decision, but but something that puts us in such an unfair position um, that, that we're put in a place where we have to approve wrong compensation or the compensation of future, future council members because we don't actually compensate ourselves unless you run again and are elected. Um, but incorporations, executive leadership approves employees' pay. Board of directors approves executive pay. Shareholders approve board members' compensation through proxy voting. This is not a position that anyone ever wants to be in. And I'm at a point, you know, this is, we're, we're there, we need to do this. Um, it, I, I plan to support it. And following the 2021 election here in a couple of weeks, I will still be compensated $800 per month. I will not benefit from this um, in this term of office. And I know some won't. And, and if we choose to run again, there's no guarantee. So it's what it is. Um, and I guess I will leave it at that. And we do want, um, we, we do want individuals on, on, on the city council to be um, compensated fairly. So I will 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Lynn. Um, I also will not benefit from this <coughs> ordinance um, as I um, in entering my third year of my term. Um, I just want to add uh, that I will not benefit at all from the reduction in boards and commissions. My boards and commissions will be exactly the same. Um, last week, while I, we were supposed to be on an off week, and I was in Virginia, I did a two-day workforce board um, a workshop with the rural consortium that I am a county pseudo county commissioner on. Um, I did that virtually. Um, so that's a sample of my boards that are at the county level. And certainly I have um, a lot of other um, internal assignments to boards and commissions that take up a tremendous amount of time besides looking at trigger canister reports till I'm blue in the face. Um, and I would like to um, echo the diversity, the, the way that I hope this will encourage a more diverse pool of candidates to consider running for council. But I, I guess I wanna put a different slant on it in a way. Um, certainly I appreciate all the aspects of diversity that this could encourage, but as an unaffiliated um, person, um, member of council, um, recognizing that Broomfield has a large, large percentage of unaffiliated members um, I would like to think that this encouragement um, by the increase in salary would encourage more unaffiliated people to run for council because it's a little more difficult, you know, without a party affiliation in running for council, even though we don't run with our party affiliations. So I would like, I would really like to think that this is this increase in compensation is going to enable many people to be able to consider in a way that they had not previously um, to run for council. So thank you. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Council Member Groom. Sure, I just want to point out that um, I'm not against the pay rates, I'm against the amount. And I think we'd be more in line, just like um, Council Member Anderson just suggested it be phased and that we look at um, a, a $200 or something much lower, the percentages is, is just inappropriate. But I also want to say um, that there is not a, a significant pay increase being proposed that would probably allow someone that's limited um, to running because of the pay. We're not, we're not really making even a part-time job pay out of this. Um, so we're still, no matter what, a labor of love. Um, however, the, the current 11 people sitting up here, um, a, lot of, a lot of us are unemployed um, right now, and a lot of council members that I know of the past were unemployed. So it, it, doesn't, it doesn't preclude people from running because we, we, we have them running right now. Um, and just because... I, because it sounds like I'm the only one against this, doesn't mean that I am financially wealthy and that I can afford this. And that's what some people have alluded to. Um, I'm making this decision um, not because I'm here and what my personal finances are, but it's more in line with what's right for the city. And right now, if we can't even pay our employees their full amount, we sure in the heck should not be paying ourselves these kind of levels of increase. So I thank you guys for your points of view. Um, and I just wanted to add that extra. Thank you. Any other further discussion? Mayor Pro Tem. Actually, uh, just a technical thing. I think my original motion shorted the, the full thing. I didn't mention the, the second public publication of this. So should that be an amendment or how should I handle it? I think you can. Mayor Pro Tem, I think just restate the motion and then council member Tessier can uh, reaffirm our second. Okay. Well, then I'd like to restate the motion that I originally made. Okay. Um, the ordinance number 2165 be adopted on first reading and the order published in full. And then also that a public hearing and second reading of the ordinance be held on October 26, 2021 at 6 p.m. 
as allowed by city council procedures and rules of order. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Will the clerk please call the roll? Anderson. Yes. Cohen. Abstain. Broom. No. Hinkle. Yes. Zersky. Yes. Lim. Yes. Lindstedt. Yes. Shaft. Abstain. Tessier. Yeah. That passes six to one. The city and county attorney's report is next. Ms. Rogers, do you have a report? No, Mayor, I don't today. Thank you. Thank you. The city and county manager's report is next. Ms. Hoffman, do you have a report? I do, but it's very brief because um, Abby Yellman and I have a uh, bet on what time we are going to conclude this year. <laughs> <laughs> and I am um I wanted to um after that that vote tonight and 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 clearly so this doesn't have any bearing on the raise or 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 or, or no um no raise but what what this council has been able to accomplish in the last year we just we don't take time in order to celebrate what some of these accomplishments have been so if you all will remember in February and March of last year we um, introduced the concept to you all that we were going to move forward on bifurcating the PNZ, um, and that was a that was a huge transformational lift um, on on many fronts. And the reason we were going to do that is because we were going to be in alignment with the new development matrix um, that had a lot of pretty colors, and all of us thought it looked really cool. But what that application meant was significantly different. So this. The system structure changes that 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 with 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 council's approval and direction, we were able to approve the largest master development agreement in baseline. Um, the the from that multi pronged approach, reactivating a collaborative approach from our matrix team on development, solidifying the development matrix, bifurcating P and Z. Which led to um, the other two big milestones that we discussed that we will talk to by the end of the year. Quite frankly, from a staff perspective, um, we thought we could accomplish it, but it was going to be a real stretch. And that was activating the Bill Town Square that's been on a hiatus for seven years. And then a very good left for the Flatirons development. So, uh, again, from a, from a nine month perspective, um, those accomplishments are really solidifying what the next five years looks like for us from an economic driver perspective and from an economic um, activation perspective. So we are grateful for your support and challenges along the way in order for us to be able to solidify those. So tonight was, was, a, was a really a, a monumental night. Um, in addition to all the two-on-ones from um, Metro districts and Finance 101, Finance 102, Budget 101, Budget 202, Budget 304, Budget 305. Um, so again, the time and effort to understand that is, is much appreciated. Um, also wanted to remind the community about the town hall meeting, which is next week. Um, on the 21st, we're going to be having um, Chief Krieger join us to provide um, um, a public safety update. Um, we've all uh, become well aware of uh, the crime that's been occurring in Brookfield. So to put it in um, context and uh, perspective, Chief Krieger will be joining us. Um, I spoke a little bit earlier about, uh, for the first time in Brookfield's history, we are fully staffed. Um, so I'm hearing some rumblings that um, were, um, um, that, that, that the police department is, is, is struggling. When we went through COVID, um, at council's direction, police department was the only department that received no cuts. They received their increases. Um, we beefed up on the training, on the equipment, um, adding the additional positions. We have another seven that are coming online in 2022. Um, and um, Chief Kriegel will, will, will be able to, again, I, I don't think we're inoculated um, from, from the impacts 
that other communities are experiencing. Um, I don't want to name those communities, but it's certainly from the perspective um, we are not experiencing that. And, and I am grateful for that um, every, every single day. Um, additionally, um, Jason Balling and uh, Deb Fetterspill will join us on the town hall meeting um, to talk about public safety, uh, I'm sorry, um, public health. Um, so those will be the two topics for the, uh, for the town hall meeting. Uh, and lastly, this is Sam's last meeting. Um, we, we, we're going to miss her tremendously. Georgia is getting uh, their peach back. Um, but with, uh, without Sam through COVID, I don't know, not only from a sense of humor perspective, but from a clerk, uh, the city county clerk's office, um, it was really transformed by Sam. And um, her family has uh, been driving to get her back and, and she is uh, acquiescing and she will be missed. Abby paid me five dollars to drag this out a little long. You know, like I like, said, so I came in during COVID, and I think that would have been a. It would have been very easy to feel very isolated and um, not part of the group, and there was a lot of transition very quickly <laughs> when I got here. But everyone here has been so incredibly gracious and made me feel so welcomed. And you guys, everyone here has been a pleasure to work with. I, you know, this was one of the things that it, it killed me. I was like, can't I just take my job with me or, you know, bring the family out here, something to that effect. But um, I want you all to know that I'm taking a piece of you in me, with me. And um, when I come back to visit, I will definitely stop by and, and wreak havoc upon your world. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Anything else, Manager Hoffman? No, thank you, Mayor. Right. I'm, I'm right on track now for the over. Okay, yeah. oh, there, there is no legislative update this evening. Item 15 A and 15 B were reviewed earlier this evening. Seeing there's no further business before the Broomfield Urban Renewal Authority, that meeting is adjourned. Item 16 A was reviewed earlier this evening. Seeing there's no further business before the Arista Local Improvement District, the meeting is adjourned. This evening, we have a brief special report pertaining to the purchase of the Frightville Marshall Division water rights. Council has a copy of the agenda memorandum, which I'll ask our staff to summarize. Thank you, Mayor. And, I'll, and, and uh, Kimberly, Kimberly Dahl, Director of uh, Public Works, these are some of the behind the scenes that so many of our uh, staff work on, and they're not jazz hands or, or sexy items, but they are key to our future. Um, Ms. Dahl, give us a a brief overview of what you've been working on, please. Thank you, Manager Hoffman. Um, first, I'd like to disclose that I don't know what time the bed is for. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and Council members. This is an informational item. As you may recall, back in March of uh, this year, report we reported to you uh, through a city manager's report that we entered into a purchase to lease for Frank O. Marshall Division water shares. We have executed that option to purchase on September 30th of this year, and that was executed with a $75,000 reduction in price, and that's in exchange for maintenance of canal improvements through the Dillon Point project. Um, as I mentioned, this is an informational item, um, but happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. We'll start with in-person public comment. Is there anyone who would like to comment on this agenda item? Please come to the podium. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> All right, questions from city councilor next. Council member Groom. Sure, thank you. Um, so a question I had in regards to maintenance of the ditch, is that just repair the ditch and where it's at right now, or is that maintenance for all the time? So Franco is requiring the Dillon Point project to make certain improvements to their section of the canal. And uh, as part of that, they require maintenance agreement. And that's the part that we will be entering into is the maintenance agreement for those improvements. So the Dillon Point will, will improve the ditch and then we will maintenance it. Correct. Okay. 
Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Let's go ahead. All right. Any other questions? <clears throat> well, thank you for the information, Ms. Dahl. If there are no requests for future action this evening, concluding our agenda. Is there any other business to come before council? There being no further business, the council meeting.